Hello, everyone. Welcome to our real time uh, stream. And uh, I am Kyle Hudak. And with me tonight, I have Jack Gibson. You're Hello right. there, everybody. It's Hello, nice Jack. Hello, what do you Kyle. Do for, what do you do for us? Oh, well, I'll do a few things. Um, you can see on your screen right now, I've been making something for the past ten months. Um, a little, a little animation. Um, um, which you'll be all be watching tonight. Um, but I do all the animations for Titanic Honor and Glory. Um, as Titanic Honor and Glory cinematic director, including the one you're watching tonight. Oh yes, and the one we're watching tonight is going to be a very great piece of work. Um, Jack's been working very hard on it for a while. Uh, a while we also have time. with the, yeah, we also have with us David Nanini. Yes, hello. And what do you do for us, David? Well, I am one of the researchers in the game, part of a very, very talented team of researchers who do excellent work every day for the project. And uh, I kind of have a lot of familiarity with the passengers and uh, the crew and the, uh, the, the narrative side of the, uh, the night. I'm not as much of a technical guy, but I, I know the story. Oh, yeah. Man, we got a lot of technical guys on the team. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> In fact, I didn't, mention, I didn't mention that my part of the thing is that I do a ton of modeling. I am the guy currently who's doing the modeling on the, um, the, the, the THG hull, the, uh, the steel structure and all that stuff. And we also have with us tonight Liam Sharp. Hello, Liam. Good evening, everybody. What do you do, Liam? I am one of the 3D modelers and CGI artists for THG, of which for this real-time syncing and animation that you are about to witness tonight, I assisted in providing historical background, uh, ensuring that the animation that you will be viewing tonight will be as accurate as humanly possible, as well as provide passenger models, background models, up detailing the overall exterior model that you are currently viewing tonight. Additionally, I helped in breaking up the model, so in the climax of this event coming up here, you will be viewing an entirely new process of how that um, will go down. Oh, that's excellent. And uh, what else do you do, Liam? Where else might people know you from? I am a 3D artist, one of the 3D artists from Mike's Ocean Liner Designs. In fact, some of you tonight might perhaps recognize me from Mike's previous Empress of Ireland stream that he did about a year ago. We are also working on another project by the name of Grand Voyage that I am a 3D modeler for. Oh yeah, so we've all seen Grand Voyage. It looks excellent. It's amazing, the kind of work that you guys are putting out. Uh, now... <clears throat> Elephant in the room. Where is our friend, my friend, your friend, Mike Brady from Motion Liner Designs? He sadly cannot be with us tonight. Uh, apparently, this has become sort of a tradition for him lately. The last couple of years, he's gotten sick during like every single Titanic event. And this year is no exception. He got a cold and, uh, yeah, lost his voice, so he cannot be with us tonight, and I am very sorry for that. Uh, he he would have been an excellent presence to have here, uh, and with his loss from the stream, that there goes about uh, about forty percent of the charisma here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's all right. I hope Mike is watching us, though. So get well soon, Mike. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes. Get well, get well, Mike. Okay. Uh, please. <laughs> we need you, Mike. So, what have we done this month so far? Well, we've done quite a lot. We've shown uh, various animations from Jack, uh, as well as uh, still images. He puts together all these incredible scenes. These incredible, you know, the Titanic leaving Southampton, um, the, you know, the sea trials and all this stuff. 
and it's, it's all just amazing to see these these moments in Titanic's history brought back to life. Um, it all started, of course, as you know, Titanic Month. Uh, this is the first Titanic Month that we've done, I think. Uh, there's been plenty of Titanic Weeks, the first Titanic Month. And we started it with the keel laying, March 31st. Uh, it was supposedly the date on which Titanic's uh, first sort of keel bars started to be laid. Although, there's debate about that. Could have been March 22nd. We don't know. It's accepted that it's the 31st. So we started with that. And since then, we have been tracking Titanic's entire voyage from the sea trials to the present with all of these different moments. We have also announced the collaboration with Mira, an incredible project. Uh, if you haven't seen that, please go look uh, at our various socials on our YouTube. I believe it's there. Uh, you'll be able to see uh, all the stuff about Mira. And then we announced the, our, um, what do you call that? A collaboration with Armist Titanic Incorporated's uh, upcoming expedition. And so what about that? <clears throat> so the THG team will be contributing to the upcoming RMST expedition to the Titanic wreck site. Uh, they are conducting a research-focused dive with ROVs, that's remote-operated vehicles, unmanned. And they've asked for our input on what we'd like to see from the expedition. So we're sending a list of recommendations that could help uh, our efforts to recreate Titanic in our projects, as well as their efforts to preserve the history of Titanic and find new information. And also, RMST has been kind enough to extend this opportunity to our fans. So later on tonight, we will show you how you can contribute your ideas to the expedition, as well as by sending them to us. So that's going to be uh, pretty exciting as well. And what else have we done? Oh, we've also, there's been some Ocean Liner Designs videos that have come out as well. And uh, Liam, Jack, anything you could say about those? Oh, well, I haven't seen it today because I've been so busy getting everything prepared for the stream. But I was doing some work with Mike just yesterday, in fact, on a video he put out a few hours ago. I'm sure many people have seen it here. Um, but it's a lovely video talking about Titanic's delivery voyage from her sea trials in Belfast, down to Southampton, and the preparation before the voyage, which it's something I've never really seen done. I've never heard much about it, and it's I haven't watched the video, but the anime we've got some new animations in that from THG. Fascinating story. Just those little little details of Titanic life we haven't really seen. Um, and that's one of one of the videos that have just come out today. But there's there's I think three more coming out uh, during Titanic month if. Um, I think Mike must have posted a schedule on his YouTube and his um, Discord. He has a public Discord as well. Um, there's a few more videos coming out as well from him, and they'll be featuring our THG animations, which will be very lovely. The little, uh, the collabor—I say a little collaboration, the big collaboration we've got with him. Um, so that'd be very nice as well for a month to remember. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you all have not seen Mike's. Uh, from Ocean Liner Designs, his newest video, Titanic Before Disaster. I highly encourage you all to absolutely check this video out. It's a nearly 50-minute length documentary, and it is an incredibly comprehensive look into the background of the Titanic, uh, the sea trials, the passengers, etc. I strongly recommend that um, you all check this out. And of course, as Jack mentioned, we have more videos that are coming out, more videos on the horizon that are going to be released on the Ocean Liner Designs channel covering the story of the Titanic. Indeed. They're gonna be they're gonna be quite good. I'm very excited for people to see them. We've been me and Mike have been working uh Mike's been working really hard on them. I've just been doing the animations, but they're gonna be quite good. I think people will enjoy. Oh indeed. I I think the content that Mike puts out is fantastic. I mean, it feels insulting to call it content, really. It's just wonderful what he does. Uh, he just has a way of speaking, and the kind of the kind of stuff, the, the way he presents his videos is great. And you guys, the work you do, just elevates it to a whole new level. And of course, you know, the work that we contribute as well. It's It's really something else. So why are we here tonight, anyway? 
the real-time sinkings. How did all of this kind of come to be? You know, uh, how, how, what was, you know, we, we all know that Jack has been working for the last year on the real-time sinking animations, but how did these animations start? Well, <clears throat> we, we, our, our history with sinkings is uh, kind of sinking stuff, if you will, has gone back quite a while. Uh, I know that way, you know, way back before even THG started, there was a precursor project called uh, Titanic Lost in the Darkness, and... There was never really anything sinking wise done with that, but the, you know, at one point in late 2012, there was like this little video posted walking around a sinking well deck, and uh, that always fascinate, fascinated me a bit because I, I was like, "Oh wow, is this could this be? You know, is there a sinking being made?" Um, it didn't quite work out that way though. But fast forward into 2013, we're in the first week of April 2013. And we have our, this is our first Indiegogo campaign was going. And we decided to create some still syncing renderings for the anniversary. At, at this point, DHG was, you know, a, a fresh project. We had come off of, uh, you know, what had happened with Lost in the Darkness. And we wanted to do something sort of impressive. You know, we wanted to mark the anniversary properly. Because the previous year with uh, the previous project, there had just been like a trailer, which had like a little bit of a sinking scene in it. But that was it. So we decided you know, we didn't have much in the engine at this point. So we decided to take our models and stuff and renderings and edit them together to make a series of like sinking images. And we posted that on the night of the 14th at different times. It was sort of an early real time thing, but done with still images. Fast forward to 2014. So we had discussed that year. <clears throat> we had discussed that year what we wanted to do for the anniversary, and we settled on doing a podcast. Now, yeah, you know, the next day we <laughs> we didn't know how to do a podcast at all. Like you know, none of us, we've never podcasted. It's 2014. There's not a lot of podcasts out there. So we, we actually went on Facebook and we were like, hey, guys, what should we use for a podcast? <laughs> and uh, someone was like, Mixler, MixLR, however you want to say it. And, and so we used that. And yeah, at the, pretty much at the last moment on the 14th, we put out this announcement. Then, yeah, we're going to hold this podcast and we're going to have this guest. He At the time, he was historian Steve Hall. And... Uh, of course, a person who used to be with our team, Tom Linsky, he was the host of that. And me and Matt were also hosts of that. And uh, now in this in that announcement, uh, let's see. Um, yeah. I actually have a little bit of a timeline I'm trying to look at here. So if I get a little confused every now and then, just uh, bear with me. So that was our basically... Uh, our event that year first sort of real-time event although we didn't have any graphics we didn't have an animation we didn't have anything like that fast forward to 2015 and there's a lot of fast forwarding in this uh march 2nd 2015 in fact i was by this point i was messing around in the uh, in unreal engine 4 <clears throat> and you know, I was basically, I was start, by that point, I was doing a lot of stuff in the engine. I was working on models. I was trying to polish them up for in-game performance and things like that. Uh, you know, Matt had made the models. I was just working on them to get them looking nice. And I decided to mess around in the engine and, you know, do a little, just do some seeking graphics. And, and so, you know, around early March, I... It got to the point where I had downloaded some water effects and things like that, and I created this sinking room sinking animation. Uh, sinking room. <laughs> reception room sinking animation. And you've all seen that, and we, in fact, we released that as a playable demo uh, a, few, uh, a couple of years back. And that was really kind of the first real sinking animation we had done. Uh, kind of real time, in the sense of it's three minutes. Uh, probably a little too fast, honestly. It was uh, something that was impressive, I think, at the time. 
and I just wish that the water looked better because back then Unreal Engine apparently couldn't handle nice water that was both transparent and reflective. So that was a pretty funny thing. And uh, I basically created that animation in just a one night and I manually animated all the chairs. And that, that I, I honestly don't know how I maintained my sanity after that, especially because there were probably easier ways of doing it. <laughs> so, so, uh, basically on March 16th of that year, I put together a very basic sinking exterior sinking scene in, uh, in the engine. And I, I use, <clears throat> I was using my, my work in progress exterior model at the time. And it, it was not very far along. There was basically the hull, superstructure, the funnels, masts, not much, no lifeboats or anything. But I stuck it in the engine. I was like, yeah, hey, do some scenes. And we kind of released some images of that. And so they, we had our second podcast that year in 2015. Uh, we, we did it, but it was our first Titanic week. So, you know, uh, basically through early April, we did the series of podcasts using Mixler again. And it, yeah, our first Titanic week. And uh, on the 14th, we finally held our second anniversary podcast. And we had a few historian guests on that one. But still, no syncing graphics, no animation. But later that year, in 2015, I was asked to make some syncing graphics for this a little mini documentary that uh, that was going to get put out uh, about the collision. Uh, and, you know, sadly, it's no longer up on our channel. But yeah, it was like the first real graphics that I did, or uh, the first real like um. What you could call like a real time sinking element. It was just the collision, just the collision scene. And because the the work in progress exterior was just not complete at all, I decided, well, I made this model years back about uh, using Virtual Sailor, this game Virtual Sailor. I made you know, some of you might remember that model. Or remember remember me from those days. Uh, so I made this model for for Virtual Sailor of Titanic. At the time, it was pretty detailed. It had all these interiors and stuff. But it decided to take that model and bring it into UE4 for these for these collision this collision animation that I was going to do. And so that 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 was the first exterior kind of sinking animation that I had really done, and that essentially served as the basis and inspiration for what would come in 2016. So what happened in 2016? Well, early that year, we were kind of going through a bit of inactivity. We were pretty quiet. You know, I don't think people had heard much from us for a couple of months. And then, you know, by by April 4th, we had not considered anything for the anniversary. Uh, what to do? Not even a Titanic week. So, you know, we had we had this call and we were like, okay, what, what what do we do this year? What, what what can we do for the anniversary that's something in the next 10 days? At this point, it was just 10 days away. And we settled on doing a real-time syncing animation. And it seemed crazy at the time, but, you know, it, it didn't... But, you know, I had thought back to the animation I had did, you know, the previous year of the collision and it seems simple enough just extend it just push it push it out and just do the whole sinking and so we did it uh by april 6th uh that year of 2016 i did further edits on the virtual sailor model i broke it apart and uh, while i did that matt went and he was the real vip of the hour he went and he MVP sorry <laughs> he he went and he modeled the interior breakage for the for the for the break zone and you know I, I I pushed the models together and I finished preparing the model by the 8th of April and I started working on that animation and this is April 8th it's got to be ready not only by the 14th but 
a couple of days before that. So there are edits and stuff that can be done. So I was already pushing things just. Ooh. And so, yeah, we had a lot of long Skype calls during the next few days. So, you know, back then, the team, we all communicated through Skype. You remember Skype, don't you? Uh, a thousand years ago. So constant Skype calls, always. I, I, that ringtone is burned in my head. I get, I just, I, I hear it and I'm like, oh, am I back in 2015, 2016? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we we had all these, I worked on the animation. We, there was a syncing timeline to that we had to work by. You know, Matt worked on lifeboat timelines. Yeah, you know, by April 9th, you know, I... Me and Tom had spent a whole night into the early morning sitting, you know, while I was sitting there animating, you know, going over the lifeboat lowering times and timelines and, you know, which boat lowers when, uh, you know, kind of what happens there. And then, you know, on the 9th to the 10th, me and Matt, we spent hours and hours on, on a Skype call just just trying to go through all these, not just the lifeboat lowerings, but the, uh, but like where, where they were kind of going away from the ship. You know, we, we spent a while just kind of animating the pads that they took, you know, over the, you know, where were they by the end of the sinking? And then on the April 10th, I pretty much had the sinking finished, but I had animated the camera path and the angles. Uh, I had opted to do one camera. One camera for the entire sinking, one shot. That was something that I was proud of at the time. <laughs> like doing this seamless, this long seamless shot of the sinking. One big unbroken uh, thing. The camera just, like if you were to take the original animation and watch it through unedited out outside the video that was posted, it's just one shot. And yeah, that was something I was kind of proud of at the time. And by the 11th of April, I had animated the particles and effects for the sinking. And at like 8.55 a.m. Central Time on April 11th, I was I told everyone, I think everything's done. And so I recorded the animation, which I did by just playing it in the editor and screen recording it with GeForce Experience. And of course, there were technical issues. Files are huge and split into pieces. I had slow, slow DSL internet at D DSL internet at the time, so I could not upload these huge files fast enough. <laughs> and, uh, we, we had uh, gotten our subscription to WeTransfer at the time. I was like, oh, maybe this will help. It, it didn't exactly. Uh, and then what I was sending, I had to send the files to Tom uh, just to can just, just so you know he could do all the editing on it, to get them together, add the text and stuff. And yeah, he was like, yeah, I've got a Mac. And they're not, these files aren't working on here. And he, he couldn't convert the footage for whatever reason. So I, I had to, I went back and I got the video files and I, I had to make them small enough to upload in time and in a format that could work on Mac. So I had to go through this whole process. I had to record at 1080p. I had to split the chunks. I had to split the videos in the chunks into like 19 minute bits to render each part into MP4 to about 500 to one, 500 megabytes to one gigabyte, and then upload uh, one part at a time. And so by 8 p.m. on the 11th, I was still uploading these these parts into zip files. And then there was a minor little issue where like the zip files weren't working. So like apparently they wouldn't. There was trouble getting them unzipped on Mac. So he had. So Matt had went and. Uh, he had to go and unzip the files and re-upload them with his better internet. And yeah, but uh, we managed to kind of, uh, then it turned out, oh, the zip files, okay, they, they can be extracted, just forget that. So I continued uploading, although at one point I was so sleep exhausted that I, I just passed, I sleep deprived, I just passed right out for like 12 hours and I forgot, I wasn't able to send more parts of the animation until after that. But yeah, after that, I had sent, I could send the rest of the parts and I had continued uh, working on adjusting some interior syncing scenes to also splice into the animation. So it wouldn't ultimately be perfectly seamless. And so by April 13th, uh, you know, Tom was editing the, uh, the audio track for the animation 
and adding the text and stuff and splicing these videos together. And on April 13th, the 14th, the video was finally rendered. And that process took ages and it had to be kept at 720p. So one, it could render fast enough and two, it could upload fast enough. And so we, we, you know, we, we started uploading this animation on the 14th in the morning and it finished around noon. And then we finally made a post and we're like, you folks are going to love what we have in store for today. And then uh, the first real time video went public around 1 p.m. Eastern on uh, April 14th, 2016. And uh, yeah, that night we held our uh, third podcast. And uh, yeah, it was yeah, at that time we we're still on Mixler. Uh, we just asked people, OK, just play this animation alongside the podcast and just follow along with us. Uh, but of course, we didn't have a Titanic week that year because we were busy working on this. And uh, yeah, uh, that, that was the first uh, stream sort of real time event that we did where we had an animation. Now, the intention behind that animation, it was a 720p low quality upload. We were, we were like, OK, we're going to have this up temporarily for our stream. And. Uh, and. We decided we were just going to have it up for a bit. And then once the stream was over, delete it. Just get rid of it. No need to have the video up. But before the stream even started, it started going viral. And I mean viral. There were there must have been news reports about it by the time we even had the podcast. And it didn't stop. It just kept going. You know, April 15th, we finished the stream it was getting a crazy number of views and it just it just kept kept going <laughs> and now unfortunately at the time we had this we used this free use uh scream sound effect uh at some point in the video and that got flagged by youtube because it also happened to be used in someone else's music video and this video got like 10 views probably not even that uh, at the time that the, our video got flagged and uh, it, you know, it was a mistake, but it got demonetized for three weeks <laughs> and, uh, you know, that really, uh, hurt the monetization on that. But, uh, yeah, this is about the video. It didn't stop the, the virality of the video. It just kept going by April 18th. It had a million views on the 19th. It had 1.75 on the 20th. It had 3 million views. And it just kept going. Uh, by May 2nd, it was 7 million. <laughs> by February 23rd, 2017, it was 17 million. And yeah, and of course, you know, there were a few other events over the, over the next while. Uh, in later in 2016, we worked on this animation for the sinking of Britannic, a real-time sinking. That one it was not like Titanic. We did not finish it right on time. We got it... Uh, yeah, yeah I, I just see in the chat here, the original syncing video from 2016 is now up to 91 million views. I don't know how that happened. 720p. So we did the Britannic animation and we finished it late. There's just a lot of stuff going on. And yeah, it, it, it was more complicated than the Titanic animation. There were water kind of water effects. There was this thing that we call the Jelly Wake uh, which was actually made for the, the Titanic animation earlier, but it was it had more use in this one. And uh, we, you know, I had used these sort of foam effects and stuff like that. And it was a much more complicated animation for like lifeboat lowerings and all that. And so in 2017, we decided in like in late 2017 to do this to redo the final plunge, the final 10 minutes or so of the uh, 2016 animation. We made big adjustments to the timings and angles of the plunge and the breakup, and we added more effects. And we also added these, uh, <clears throat> these, these peeps, these static people. Uh, they, they were just, they had one color, they were black. Uh, there were life jackets that were stuck to them. Nothing fancy, nothing complicated. And... But, you know, I had these I had these little guys just running around the decks as the ship is sinking. It's kind of terrifying when you think about it, like when you really think about it. 
uh, th this animation. It wasn't the whole thing. It was just the last like 14 or so minutes. And by I think it was like a, into next year, in, into 20, like, uh, yeah, no, it was in, sorry, it was in December 2016 that this work had started. And by early 2017, it had been finished. And so we had posted this little clip of the plunge, and that was it. And then for uh, April 2017, we decided to, uh, we decided to, actually before that, work earlier in the, the year had uh, begun on something we called Demo 2.5, which was, eventually became Demo 3. The original intention of Demo 2.5 was to just have... Just a moment. There we go. So the original Demo 2.5 was just supposed to be... Oh, it's Demo 2, but it's got... VR. That's it. And, uh, it snowballed. Snowballing is just a thing that we do. We just, we start working on something, and then it just, whoop. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> so, very quickly, dem the, this Demo 2.5, Demo 2 with VR, turned into, let's add a boiler room. Which, to be fair, was a thing I did kind of on my own. I didn't even really tell anyone about it until I did it. Now let's add more rooms that weren't in Demo 2. Let's bring back the Demo 1 spaces. And I was like, let's have it in a port. Maybe Southampton. No. Belfast. Because you don't want to give away Southampton. That's going to be in the game. Let's do Belfast. And so we did, we did Belfast. And that later, of course, got expanded in 2023, as you all seen. Oh, you know, with the gantry and all that. And for the Belfast scene, we needed a more complete looking exterior model. And so I took the work in progress exterior model that I had made at the, at the, made at the time, and I added all kinds of stuff from my virtual sailor model uh, to it. And that is sort of the model that you see in Demo 3. And that, is, uh, that model would eventually kind of on the basis of the model that you're going to see in the animation tonight and also in last year. Now, we finally, on the 14th, 15th of April that year, we held our fourth sinking anniversary live stream or uh, sort of live event. But for the first time, 2017, we held it on YouTube, not Mixler. And that was the last anyone, the last, previous year was the last anyone had seen of Mixler. And from then on, we did these events on YouTube. <clears throat> and we, 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 we just reused 2016's animation for that on this live stream with the slowed down version of the post-break uh, plunge spliced in. Because at the time, when we did the first animation, we thought, this is too fast. You know, the ship breaks, and then within like 30 seconds, it's gone. That just didn't seem uh, possible or likely. So later in 2017, we worked on a little documentary called uh, Titanic 20 Years Later with James Cameron. And we had to work on a bunch of things for that. We had to dock together the Strauss suite uh, and we had to do very we had to do footage of other interiors and stuff. And I had, had to make Davit and lifeboat models, new high detail light models for those things. And, and those were used to make a, sort of little animations showing the lifeboats being prepared, you know, the, the cloth covers being taken off and uh, different things happening, and then the, bo the boats being sort of um, taken out, uh, swung out, and then lowered. And, you know, the, some of these static people were used in the lifeboats at one point. You, know, you could see them kind of filling the boat, stuff like that. I don't know, I remember how much of that's visible in the documentary, but they were these animations were used in there. Uh, but similar animations would eventually also, be, and, and these models would kind of, I believe, Jack, uh, you'll have to tell me here, these animations were in some way kind of implemented, this kind of animation was implemented in the new syncing, wasn't it? Sort of? At least the models were. Uh, a few of the models, yeah. Like the... The little people walking around and stuff, like the um, 
that kind of thing. Um, we got a bit of that. I mean, we got plenty of that. Yeah. Um, we've got new models for them as well. We've got tons of new models for them because we only had a few pauses for them. So we've got um plenty more this year. Uh, but last year we only had the same as the twenty seventeen one. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, those models have uh, come in use at one point. I think in 2019, I had actually taken the Davit model and 3D printed it as like an actual working model that you can crank. I even got it on my shelf up here. You, you can actually crank it and it works. It's pretty neat. It was printed with FDM. So, fast forward again. 2018. April 2018. At this point, uh, a bunch of the team had traveled overseas you know, going to the UK and France, you know, they had met up with some of the other team. They were doing research and other stuff. They were going around to, like, the different houses and, and the, like, the hotels and the places that have all this paneling from, from, like, Olympic. And I think there was even a house with paneling from Britannic. And as a result, we could not hold a proper... There was no live stream that year for the sinking. And despite that, we still had a Titanic week. Uh... We, we had a, a bunch of these videos that were put up about, like, the evolution of the real-time sinking and um, a bunch of other stuff. And then at, but after that, there was, like, a little live stream while the, che- while the team was on the trip. And then fast forward again to 2019. Dollhouse. And right now, can't see Jack, but I think he's smiling. The Dollhouse. <laughs> what is... What? What what is the dollhouse you ask? Well, <clears throat> back in uh, on like March twentieth, twenty nineteen, we had this discussion again about what to do for the anniversary. And you know what? At least this one was like, you know, sixteen days earlier <laughs> than twenty sixteen. Uh, and I, I and I was like, you know, I'm feeling. Uh, lucky, maybe we should do a more polished version of the whole, whole sinking animation, not just the plunge, the whole thing. So I was like, okay, gonna do, gonna, gonna try to do a new sinking animation. So as soon as that decision was made, I started working on a new version of the sinking model because before doing the animation, I was like, okay, the virtual sailor model is bad. Uh, this isn't gonna look as good now because it's 2019 and we're all watching this stuff and yeah, uh, you know. It's, 1k 2k 4k whatever and so i took the demo 3 model uh, which had the more detailed exterior hull and all that stuff and i then took this other model that i had started making for a game called virtual sailor it was like uh, it was like a um a sequel to virtual sailor sort of and I took parts from that. I attached them to this model, and I did a few other things. I took the davits from the 2017 documentary, and I put those on. But the thing that made this model, and the thing that took way too much time, it was a snowball. Another uh, THG snowball, TMCR, is the low-poly dollhouse interiors. They were just simple models of rooms and stuff that you see through windows and portholes with, like, lighting baked in with textures and stuff. And this process took all the way until the anniversary of making these models. Don't know why I did it. Uh, Thinking back, it was ridiculous. I could have just skipped it, but I didn't. And basically, by the 14th, you know, like, this this work was actually kind of done... A few days before, but by that point, I was like, okay, there is... I've got the model in the engine now. I've got the dollhouse model. It looks okay. The lifeboats weren't even fully set up yet, though. And it was like, oh no. It's almost the 14th. And uh, there's no animation done at all. So we get to the 14th. Me, by that point, having tried to start doing an animation. But yeah, just no time. So we had to, and we, unfortunately, we had kind of announced already that we were going to do another animation, and it didn't, yeah, so that was a little bit of a disaster, really. And we had to go to a backup plan of just streaming the original 2016 syncing animation from within Unreal Engine. 
Yeah, although at that at the end of that stream, I believe we showed off the dollhouse model. And so that was our fifth sort of real-time stream on April 14th, 2019. Uh, no Titanic week that time. And so later that year in 2019... Well, later in 2019, the, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I lost my track on this thing here. Yeah, later in 2019, we were contacted by this production company for, to, for working on this uh, documentary. I believe it was uh, 10 Mistakes That Sank Titanic, something like that. And, you know, after some negotiations and stuff, we were like, okay, well, well this is like in August 2019, going into September and... We were like, okay, we'll do this. They wanted various material. They wanted like, screenshots, some interior, exterior footage, and uh, other odds and ends. But the one big thing they wanted was an animated underwater collision sequence. And this had to be made from scratch. And so I was like, I, I think at this point, just before this, I had started working on a new exterior model. And by this point, I was like, well, I guess I won't be working on that for a while. <laughs> so, a little bit of a snowball here, too. So, by September 25th that year, uh, we, I'd finished this animation. It was like this really cool underwater view of the ship approaching the iceberg. It hits the iceberg. You see ice cracking all over the place, floating all over, falling. There's bubbles coming out. You can see the damage in the hull. Uh, and you could also see the propellers turning, the rudder, you know, bubbles coming out and all that. Well, you know, it was actually not bubbles. It was like smoke effects. Uh, but it was all, it was an interesting visualization. And that would also, the elements of that would also kind of come to be used in the future animations. And so, you know, fast forward a little bit through 2020. You know, we had worked that first half of that year and a bit of the last year on uh, Britannic, Patroness of the Mediterranean. That was a turn that also snowballed massively. Uh, it was supposed to be done earlier, and it just, and then I was like, hey guys, let's do a better version of the Britannic model because, similar to the Virtual Sailor situation, the model used in the original 2016 Britannic animation was not very good. So we did that, and yeah, that took a while. And so in April 2020, you know, we had our fourth Titanic week and the sixth uh, real-time stream. And we released you know, a series of videos and all this stuff leading up to the 14th. And then we posted the full, the, that old animation from whenever it was, 2016-2017, of the 14-minute the final plunge. But, you know, of course, we didn't have a new animation otherwise. And we, yeah, of course, on the 14th, 15th, we held our next live stream there. And that used the old animation, of course. And, you know, fast forward to 2021. You know, the team had a change up. You know, of course, you know, Tom, he wanted to raise a family and everything. And he just felt best to, you know, to leave and go, you know, the project. Clearly, we were going to, we were looking to kind of change direction a bit. And so, you know, it's just sort of the best course of action to do. And by 2021, we were like, okay, well, what do we do now? You know, what's, 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 the, we're doing this new direction. What do we want to focus on? And we were like, okay, let's just trim things down a bit. We'll focus on the ship to such a degree that we were like, okay, we're, we're so busy doing all this other stuff. We're not going to do a stream this year. And so there was no stream or Titanic week on our end. Uh, that year but we were like okay uh you know maybe next year maybe you know a couple years down the line we'll do something but that year we were just we were focusing on the ship we were focusing on updates putting out videos about progress that we were working on uh at, i believe at that time we had quite a few like streams and videos going out so by 2022 we had some major setbacks you know, 2021 turned into a pretty stressful year and we decided you know we, we had uh we had parted uh with uh with someone we had been working with uh, like a, uh, another team from the previous year and we our alpha had been delayed and we had recently released demo 401 and that was about it 
And so by April of 2022, we were like, okay, what do we want to do here? And it was like, why not just uh, just do another you know, sinking event, like a like a stream or something, like a Titanic week? <clears throat> and so that's what we did. And uh, so we held our you know our seventh stream that year, and we did, we put out a bunch of stuff for Titanic week. And at the time, I was making these updates to um, to. Uh, demo 401 adding these spaces these crew spaces again another snowball and by that point we were like okay maybe this update for the demo will come out soon so let's put out some videos and show it off of course that didn't happen it took like almost another year <laughs> for that to get done uh but that year yeah we, we did our seventh stream and uh, yeah, it went well enough, but we didn't have a new animation still. We still had to use the 2016 animation. And so that's uh, what we did. We we just spliced in part of the final plunge and it was like it just it was a Franken animation of like old stuff. And then Jack. Uh, Jack. Come in. Hello. Yes, Mr. Jack Gibson. Mm-hmm. Do Hello. you just a quick question? Do you have the uh, little timeline? Are you looking at it right now? Are you at the right spot? I am looking at it. I'm uh huh. At Good. Uh huh. Well, yeah, yeah. Jack Gibson joins THG. Why don't you take over from here? Why don't you tell your story here? I will indeed. So I'll start a bit before this timeline begins. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit back. I'll not. I'll not take too long. Don't worry. But. 2015 is when I first knew of THG. Um, I played Demo 1 when I was... I must have been 10. I was 10 years old. I played Demo 1, and I was like, this is the best thing ever. I was obsessed. I remember I had, like... I had one pound pocket money donated that to... I think the Indiegogo, or maybe the website. I can't remember. But then I played that, and I saw the sinking images you'd made in 2015 and i was like oh this looks so cool um and you know i, I kept on track with the game i i kept looking at the updates and then 2016 rolls around and i see this real-time syncing goes up the 2016 one and i'm like this is the best thing ever i'm like i'm i would have been 11 years old at that point and i was sitting watching it the day after it came out obviously because i had school um and I was telling everybody at school about this incredible real time syncing. And I was like amazed. It was the it was the breakup that got me because I didn't I was so used to the movie. We were all so used to the movie. And then to see it break up in this completely different way was just incredible. Absolutely incredible. And I remember the twenty seventeen syncing final plunge came out. I was obsessed with that. Demo three came out. I played that for too many hours. That's probably in the 300, 400 hour range now. I would not be surprised. Um, I was just obsessed. And I was I stuck around for the anniversary live streams. Um, the 2017 uh, live stream was my first one. I, I asked my parents, could I stay up for it? They said yes. Um, and it was incredible. I was captivated by the whole thing. It was the... It was, it was doing it at the same time as the ship sank that really kind of got me. Like, seeing all this happen to the minute it was really happening. And I, I was only 12 then, in 2017, but I was, like, I was just captivated by it. So I, 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 every other stream that you've had, I watched. And then um, I played all the demos. I played Britannic, Patrons of the Mediterranean. Um, and that had a gorgeous syncing in it as well. And this is when I started making a few cinematic videos in Patroness of the Mediterranean. And then Titanic Demo 401 is released in the uh, Christmas of 2021. And I played that for hours, weeks, days, didn't shut up about it to all my friends. Um, and I made, I made a short four minute video with some music over in January of 2022. At the same time I joined the THD patron and the team noticed it got posted on the Facebook and I was like freaking out. 
I think my Instagram story was filled with it. I was telling everyone, I was like, oh my god, Titanic Under and Glory have noticed this video I made. The video now is like two years old and it's 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 nothing great. Um I'm still a bit proud of it, but I did that. The team noticed and then in late March you were making a um this is in twenty twenty two, you were making a like cinematic video inside the uh demo, but you didn't have anyone to film it. So you asked in the Patreon chat, Hey, is anyone around to film it? And I was around that day. I I think I was meant to be at school, but I was off that day. So I went around and filmed it, and then um, you, I think you started noticing, the team started noticing a little bit, uh, the stuff I was doing. So, And then it, it, this is around the same time that now Demo 2.1, which was previously 2.0, which was previously called 1.5, that was coming out. And I remember, I think Derek sent it to me just to test, like, a very early build. And I made, a, like, a mocked-up trailer, and I was like, oh, so this is how I would shoot a trailer for the new update. Just out of the blue, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll pitch my idea. And he says, oh, this looks great. And then 20 minutes later, he gets back to me, and he says, would you like to join us as a volunteer? And before he even, a few seconds after he sent it, I was immediately spamming, yes. I, I, I must, I was jumping around my room in excitement and this was only a volunteer role it was oh it was incredible um i didn't do too much during the year because the demo had already been out um but you know i saw the updates and that was posted in inside the team and it was incredible it got to november and i made a cinematic video for um a project in november of 2022 and that's when I got a message from James asking if I would join his media manager. And I was jumping around my room in excitement yet again. Um, it was, it was the, I think, the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, I, it's, I just, it's incredible. It's the best thing that ever happened. And then I remember, you'll remember this, Carl, very well. I was asking slash begging to play with the dollhouse model inside the Unreal Editor, and a, a, a cold winter's day in January, I think it was a winter's night actually, you, you messaged me with, you said you had a surprise, and I was curious what this was, I thought, oh, it's just gonna be like a cool render yeah, oh. he did. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that, I, I was <laughs> like, you, you, yeah, you had been begging me for a while, Kyle, 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 <laughs> send me I... the dollhouse, I want the dollhouse. <laughs> I was, be I, cause I was obsessed with that dollhouse model from when it first got, cause it was the demo free hull, which became the dollhouse with the interiors. I was obsessed with that hull since demo three. Yeah, yeah, and, like, like, yeah, you get to see it up close in demo three, and then I believe, well, you you probably saw some glimpses of it, either posted here or there or in that uh, the in our stream from twenty nineteen. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing. Did you? Yeah. There, there was some sailing animations as well with the jelly yeah, work. Sailing animation, the jelly and wake, the jelly, the jelly wake. wake, and these animations were incredible. I I remember some some of the, somehow they got one of them got leaked. I had it as my wallpaper. I had an animated three D wallpaper. I had it as my phone, iPad, computer wallpaper, just everything. I was obsessed with this model. So, and then you said you have a surprise, and surprise is a link. I open the link. Oh, it's the dollhouse. It's the 2016 animation. It's the 2017 <laughs> animation. It's the Britannic yeah. model. I, I I remember that. I I was on disc. We were on Discord. It was late at night, and I I had up just uploaded everything. I took all of this into the yeah the uh 2016 animation collision for the from ten mistakes the redone final plunge with the peeps the uh mm -hmm. the dollhouse model and. I don't even know what else. There's probably more. I just sent this all to Jack, and it was like, "Here you go." And then, and the funniest thing was that, like, before he knew what was in it, I w I went in the chat on Discord, and I was like, "Yeah, so this file includes a 2016 animation." And Jack was like, oh, "No way!" <laughs> and then I was like, "And it includes the collision animation made for it." And he's like. Oh. And then I was like, and it's got the redone final plunge. And then I said, but wait, there's more GIF. And uh, 
<laughs> I think oh. Jack was about to have a stroke at that point. I oh, I was freaking out. It was like, incredible. Yeah, I was like, Utterly yeah, here's incredible. the dollhouse. <laughs> and that's when I was. It was it. Oh, it was just the best. And I had brunch the next day with a few of my friends, and it's three in the morning, and I had brunch at like eleven. And I was so mad. I wanted to cancel brunch and just play with the dollhouse, but I had to go to brunch. I rushed through it. I was like, okay, I gotta go home early. Bye, sorry. And then get home, play with the dollhouse, and oh, it was incredible. Um, and within two days of getting that dollhouse, I started to sink it. And I, I remember mentioning it to the team, oh, should I, I'd love to do like a real time sinking. And I think it got said, oh, we haven't really got the time, it'd be too many resources and whatnot, and that was completely fair, because we were focusing on getting the demo 2.0 update out. Um, I, I, I but... believe, Jack, and I can't exactly quote it, uh, I believe your words also, when when I was like sending you this stuff, was uh, time to snowball new syncing animation. Just kidding. <laughs> I could never be A-worded. Mm-hmm. I I remember I remember thinking I'd never do it. I'd never do one because, as I've learned from doing two of them now, they are quite the undertaking. But you no, know, I did I did a final plunge animation and use everyone's seen it. It's the twenty twenty three one, and I made that and I was like, this is great. And I was like, we could probably put this at the end of the twenty sixteen animation and do another stream, and then. I sat and fought for a bit longer, and it gets, I think it was around the end of January, start of February. I had an iceberg collision I'd also made up with the old iceberg model, and there was this beautiful iceberg model on the Unreal Engine Marketplace that I saw, and I thought, oh, I could do an iceberg collision as well for them, you know, just, that would be nice, and oh, I'll, I'll do a bit of the middle sinking, and then one thing led to another, and I was like, I'm gonna do the full sinking. The whole two hours, 40 minutes. And so I begin. And I only had, I think, a month, really. Because the it, I started it in the very beginning. I think the 5th of March I started it officially. I was like, I'm going to do this, I think. Um, And by, like, the 15th, I think I already had a rough cut up. I don't know how I did it that quickly. But, I mean, the 20, 23 animation, I'm not too proud of the visuals in it. You can see it's not the cleanest. Um, and so, I, um, I made that, had the team's help, we did the research, we, by the end, by the time it had already been animated, we'd come across Samuel Halpern's research paper, so we did a few adjustments in the edit to basically, um, you know, make it line up with his timeline a bit more, but we'd already animated it, some of the angles were a bit off. I know many people have mentioned that the angles of the ship, the, the, the list and the trim is a bit off, and yeah, they are. The 2023 animation isn't my proudest project, but it was my first Unreal Engine project, so I'm going to give that as my excuse as to why it's got a few rough edges. Um, So we got all cut up by the 18th, and my sound design was horrible because I was using a pair of headphones that had one ear and they were mono, so it just sounded horrible. Um, so Matt did the sound design, I did, I rendered a few more interiors for him, I used that old reception room demo from back in 2017, 2018, and then we were, we were like, okay, this is in a good spot, I think. We released the trailer, and I was so excited, because, like, this, this is a thing that I'd seen as a kid, I was 11 watching these animations, and now I'd made one, albeit kind of a rough one, but I'd made one, so... You know, uh, we it gets to the April thirteenth. Um, the com animation's completely finished, rendered, uploaded. We're all ready to go for the fourteenth. That live stream went incredible. Um, it was you, Kyle, Matt, and David were on that stream. I watched it. It was one of the best nights of my life. I was, I just, it was such an accomplishment, and. I, I think, and we uploaded it on the 15th, I watched the premiere, I had one of my friends sitting with me in a call, um, and I was just, I was so proud of what, of what I'd done with, and with, with the team as well, I can't just credit myself, I had the whole team behind me with that, and it was good, it was a good animation, 
but it could have been better. And I remember saying, I'm not doing another one, because I thought the 2023 animation was too much to do. But I had no idea what was coming. I had no idea. And it says in the timeline, oh no, another snowball. So, May 2023, I did a sinking animation of the Lusitania, literally in a week, I think, because for my own channel, Jack G Animations, if you want to subscribe. And um, it was... It was it was a quick thing. I'm not the proudest of it, um, but it was something. I was proud of it. And around this time, I uh, Mike Brady from Oshline Designs, um, he partnered slash collaborated with us, and we have this beautiful partnership going now, where he can use all our visuals, all our animations, and I also joined his team as the animator. So all his videos with animations, they're my animations, and it's a beautiful connection we've got where I can animate for THG, but also for him. It's two birds with one stone sort of thing. I do animations of the Titanic, which THG can use and Mike can use, and then I also do separate animations of other ships for Mike. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. And so once the Lusitania was done, once I'd done a few videos with Mike, it's around June time, and I'm looking at the 2023 animation, and it's already, I'd done an Empress of Ireland animation as well, and it had reflective water, the 2023 animation didn't have any water at all that was reflective, I think the tiniest few shots had reflective water, the rest looked, it, it was, it would look like Claire, really, so I begin, um, I I begin thinking, what if I um, what if I remastered the twenty twenty three one, or what if I made a new one entirely, and that's the first snowflake on the biggest snowball that I've ever done, and so I decide we're gonna make a new animation. So in July, Liam, I messaged you because you had also joined us with Oshine Designs and THG, and I said, hey. Could you break up the dollhouse model for me? Because 2023's breakup was literally just you had the bow, the stern, and when the ship broke in half, there's two sections in the middle. There's a forward tower and an aft tower. The forward tower had the third funnel under it. The aft tower was your grand stair aft grand staircase section. So the ship really broke into three, into four. It broke up into many pieces. It wasn't just two big sections. And the first animation only had those three sections and it was very rough it wasn't the best so i sent that to you liam and within a day yeah yeah you had it absolutely. done you had it done so quickly and it looked incredible it was i remember we had a bit of a hassle getting the model working because getting it out of unreal engine was a nightmare but we got it out we got it over to you i think you did one and it was the textures weren't working because I'd exported it improperly. So you had to do it again, but you did it again. It looked incredible. Uh, sorry for not getting it right the first time, but we got it in the end. And um, it's you were incredible with that. And then I wanted a better iceberg because the iceberg wasn't, it wasn't accurate in the 2023 animation. We We didn't really have the best, you know, um, iceberg. It wasn't accurate to the images. I'm sure everyone's seen the Rock of Gibraltar iceberg image taking, not sure what ship it was taken on, but it was taken on a ship that was passing. You can see a huge section that's been carved off, and people on the ship described the iceberg as looking like that, so we know it was probably that iceberg. So you modelled that I think in a day? Like, I, I don't know how you do it, Liam. I'm going to be truthfully honest. You just, <laughs> you're just magic with your models. Uh. Um, and, and you made it so you can have, when the ship hits, it carves off a huge section. And I think there's a hundred or so pieces that can all fall off individually. And I animated all those pieces for tonight. And it looks incredible. I have to thank you for that. Because, and you also did a few of the people in the sinking. Because last year... We had these two or three people, they looked like they were dancing, kind of. They had their arms stuck out and these life jackets that didn't really look good. And so, um, 
you made the, we had these people made for the Empress of Ireland. So I stole the model we used on the Empress of Ireland. It was these ladies with these dresses on, and I found a hat model. I put a hat on some of them. I shrunk some of the models to have women and children. So you help with the people. And so we had these brilliant new people for the sinking. We had this incredible new model that was upgraded. It could break into many pieces. Um, and so it was, we had all these pieces. And I'm going to let you elaborate a bit more on the exact modifications you made, because I know you made quite a few. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um... So when it comes to modifying this dollhouse model, which we explained previously, the very first thing that I did was take the dollhouse model and more accurately break it up. So thankfully, we actually have diagrams of what the breakup might have potentially looked like. We have diagrams showing what the towers look like, the forward and aft tower. We have diagrams showing all the shell plating that came off. And I used these diagrams and these um artifacts and photographs of these artifacts and what i essentially did was align them with the dollhouse model and i very carefully traced each broken piece each tower to be as accurate as possible so when we watch the animation in the coming hours and we see the breakup just know <laughs> that um the breakup that you are going to be seeing is going to be as accurate as humanly possible. Now, the next thing I did was create a brand new iceberg for this. Um, now, in the previous animation, which Jack explained, the iceberg that was used was not entirely exact to how the survivors describe it, not exact to how the photographs show it. So what we did this year was we took photographic record and survivor testimony, witness testimony, etc. And we combined it into one, essentially. And using those accounts, using those records, we were able to create a very accurate and detailed iceberg model that will be featured in this upcoming animation the next hour. Now, what I also did was to add further detail to it, I broke up this iceberg. So when the ship um, when the ship collides with the iceberg in the future, we'll be able to see the iceberg collapsing onto the deck, floating in the water, etc., which Jack meticulously animated. I don't know how he does it, but um, yeah, that must have been uh, quite a lot of work, but uh, regardless. A long time. Ja the yeah. reason Jack G, it means Jack genius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously though, Jack, uh, uh, lots of work went into this. Lots of work went into this. Indeed. It's it's not it's and it's it's a team effort. It's it's a hundred percent a team effort. I can't take credit yeah. for all of this because the, the incredible dollhouse, the whole Carl, you made that. Liam, you made the incredible iceberg. You broke up the dollhouse even more so we could get this incredible detail with the sinking. You did these new people, um, and it's 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 very much a team effort. And we've got this incredible research team behind us. Um, I have to give a shout out to Robin as well. He's been incredible with research. Um, he's he did a deep dive into the final plunge, survivor testimony, because the final plunge is the most. It's it's such a it's it's a mess. It's it happened so quickly and it was so dramatic that the survivor testimonies are so like. They're, hor they're, they're, they're horrible to read, but they're fascinating because there's so much detail. And when you read into it and when you begin to animate what they describe, stuff starts to add up, stuff starts to link up, and it makes sense visually. When you read it, it doesn't make sense what they're saying. But when you animate what you think they're describing and you add up all these testimonies, it works really well. And it's definitely a team effort. And... We have we've got these incredible models, these incredible this incredible iceberg, incredible people, and another thing we had for this animation as well. Also, on the note of the people, I have to give a shout out to Danny Malloy for crafting these beautiful life jackets, because the life jackets we had last year, they were they were messy. They didn't really they they were old. They were rough. They worked. They were very good for the time, and we used them last year. And I mean, I didn't mind them, but. 
We we def we he upgraded them for me. I think in about twenty minutes he sent them to me, and they look incredible. I put them on some some people have them, some people don't. It's just another piece of this animation that just it just it it makes it better than last year. There's just that those little details, and the final thing with this animation before I go on to how it was made is the visuals. They were completely overhauled. Last year we used the default lighting system from um, from UE4 and it doesn't look good. We used Lumen this year, it's got all these dynamic lighting, um, you can get these incredible shadows, it's beautiful. We added, we made the water reflective, it's not clear anymore, it's actually reflective, it looks like water. It's slightly transparent so you can see the portholes as the ship goes under, it's beautiful. Um, and you can see we've got a beautiful blue tint to the horizon. It's incredible. But I'll get on to how I did the animation because I'm I'm going on a bit much. But um, we we had a brilliant research team. Um, and I began animating in October. Um, and I did the the trims, the heels, the basically the angles the ship took as it was sinking. Using Samuel Halpern's new timeline, he released last March, I believe it was, and his 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 research has been invaluable to the team. It's it's extraordinary stuff. Um, and then we also did the lifeboat times based on his work. And once we had the lifeboats done, we did the I got the I got the people in, and then once all the people were in, I started focusing on the final plunge, and I sat for. I think four hours with Robin getting it perfect, and we're, I'm very happy with how it looks. It's it's what I believe happened. It's what we believe as a team happened. And then we got to the breakup. The breakup is com being completely overhauled from last year. Um, it's 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 horrifying, really. It's it's not it's not something fun to make, despite the team effort and despite how jovial we might sound it's not these aren't that we're doing this as a commemoration to those lost it's it, it's a it's a it's a great thing we're doing um and i i couldn't be prouder of the team we've got here um because at the end of the day we we're remembering the 2208 people who are on that ship on that fearful maiden voyage and at the end of the day this real-time sinking is to commemorate all of them because they went through something absolutely horrible and it's it's so important we remember them and so i am so so proud we can be doing this and i'm so so proud of the team we've got here because it, it's it's just incredible what what we what we've done here and i'm i can't thank my team enough i can't thank the people who've helped me out with this enough it's truly incredible um and yeah, so I got the people and I I began rendering it once the team were happy with how it looked and then we had an animation and I rendered it, I edited it, edited it, uh I did all the sound design which took it took it takes a while. Um but we got that done. We've got, we've had about four rough cuts, but we've we've got the syncing's done. It's complete. And it's I've I'm so so proud of it. I've watched. I haven't watched the full thing yet. I've edited it, and my the team have. The team have watched it. It's all good. There's uh, there's no hiccups in it. Um, so yeah, it's the the sinking stern, and I couldn't be prouder of our team. So yeah, that that's that's the story of this real time sinking and the evolution of them. Yeah. It's it's pretty incredible work that's been done, and I I of course need to mention that uh, there's also a potential uh, documentary uh, in the works, uh, sort of based on this animation. We're really excited to be working with Atlantic Overseas Pictures Television and Bungalow Entertainment. They reached out uh, to potentially you know they're potentially making a full Titanic uh, sort of TV program centered around the new real-time sinking animation and they've been hard at work making this a reality so big shout out to Harris Solomon and Robert Friendman for their support of this year's animation and our work we will keep all updated on that project 
and there's a couple of house cleaning things. One is um, I, I earlier I mentioned, you know, I was talking about the history of the animations. I would be remiss not to mention that uh, back in 2021, uh, Tom Linsky, of course, he uh, with his uh, his incredible team at HFX Studios, they uh, did their own animation and they started doing their own sort of uh, yearly uh, anniversary commemorations. In fact, they have one going right now. <laughs> when else would you do them? And, uh, you know, of course, it, it's on the channel. It's on his channel, Part-Time Explorer. It's, you know, incredible, incredible, amazing content on there. A lot of adventurous stuff, you know, a lot of explorations, a lot of... Uh, they had to do their own animations of all kinds of stuff. Uh, in fact, they've even branched out. They, they did one recently of uh, a train wreck, uh, the wreck of the broker, I believe. And, you know, it's uh, you know, a couple of us on the team, especially me and James, we're huge train buffs. We love that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you know, it's um, it, it's, you know, it's it's worth mentioning because, you know, it, it's, they do great stuff as well. And they've uh, got a nice uh, raft of historians helping them out. So what else we got here? There's Super Chats. I wanted to mention that we're, you know, I wanted to thank everyone tonight so far and who are, who are going to who are sending super chats uh thank you very much for your generosity but i I will say that we're not tonight we're not going to be shouting these out we're not going to be uh answering these sort of uh sort of talking about the super chats um so i hope uh, you'll uh respect that it's you know there's a certain tone tone that we want to take with this and uh, it, there's also just so much happening that we got to keep an eye on our timelines and all that. And another thing is, uh, there's probably a few people out there who would love for us to like talk about certain things like the Titan, the Titan submersible disaster. Um, we're not going to address that. We're, we're not going to talk about it. It's something that's subject to ongoing investigations, endless speculation, and it involves people who were close to us and close to the people we work with. We don't we're not touching that uh, we're not touching that but it, it was a tragic event that happened and uh, what else do we got um yeah it's uh yeah you know, what else uh jack uh liam uh david anything any thoughts so far um i'm 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 just i'm excited to get into this um we could perhaps yeah. talk about what's going on with the Titanic right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, before uh, before we do, one thing I forgot. Um, as you know, uh, Matt, our executive producer, he's he spent he spent quite a few years working on uh, a set of deck plans uh, for all the you know, Olympic class liners and stuff. Uh, at this point, he's always working on them. They're incredible. They're very detailed. They're based on iron plans and all this research that we have over the, you know, like uh, primary reference material and stuff like that, uh, you know, spec books and all that. And, uh, you know, these right now he's, you know, not to, you know, not to, you know, I'm not going to go crazy promoting stuff, but at the moment there is like a 20% off sale, uh, I believe, uh, at titanicdeckplan.com. And I believe the discount code is Titanic112. So if you want to check those out. So, all right. We are going to have to throw things uh, forward pretty soon to the guys in Orlando. So let, let's set the scene real quick. We've only got a few minutes. What's happening on Titanic at this time as it's sailing over the Atlantic, uh, heading towards the iceberg? David. Oh yeah, here? David. All, oh yeah, all you guys can uh, tell us what's happening on the ship. Okay, thank you. Um, so just real quick, I would like to mention that the um, the Titanic at this point, the weather conditions, it is a perfectly clear sky. The sea is flat, calm. It is just absolutely clear, crisp clear out. Um. And this will um, this will come to play in the future here, the near future here. I just wanted to note that. And I don't know if anyone's been out at sea at night, but if you were to look at the sky out at night, the amount of stars that you can see, it, it, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. And I think Jack did a beautiful job replicating this in this animation.
Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, on board Titanic, there are people, they're heading to bed. It's late at night, the dinners are over. There's <clears throat> yeah, passengers, they are, they're getting taken, they've taken their baths, they're getting in their, their jammies, they're getting in bed, some are reading, some are still up, some are sound asleep. There are uh, stewards in the first class dining saloon, they're setting tables for breakfast the next day. There's, you know, the officers on the bridge, just a routine night. The guys in the crow's nest, you know, people going about their uh, their watches and stuff like that. <clears throat> you know, there's a guy on the docking bridge just kind of keeping watch. There's uh, someone, I believe, on the compass platform checking, you know, going around checking the compasses and stuff. There are men in the smoke room this late hour. They're playing cards and all these games, having their drinks and their cigars and all that. You know, as they do. And what else is happening on the ship, David? Well, in the wireless room, they are very busy handling all of the traffic that they have to send to Cape Race, which has dominated the airwaves for most of most of that Sunday, the 14th. Um, right now, they've been overheard by a number of ships in the area, including the Frankfurt, the Asian, the Parisian, uh, Carpathia and uh, a number of other ships. Uh, we uh, They also were in touch with the Californian about probably 10 to 15 minutes ago by my clock uh, in the infamous shut up, shut up, I am busy exchange uh, where Californian just sort of barged into Titanic's uh, transmissions to Cape Race with a warning that they were stopped uh, by the ice field. But uh, they are continuing to transmit at this time just to clear that backlog of messages that they've accumulated throughout the voyage. And, um, yep. Oh, yeah. And let's see, what, what else? What else is happening? Hmm. It's mainly, it's just people, you know, there's also guys down in the boiler rooms they're just always shoveling coal and they're going in shifts and stuff. And it's very, it's very hot down there. You have a uh, quartermaster row back on the, uh, Oh yeah. He's the, the guy on the bridge uh, on the stern. Yeah, yeah. The docking bridge later on, he's going to think he sees a sailboat and that poor guy, he's going to not know what's happening for a while. He'll be more out of the loop than me sleeping in on a Monday. And I think uh, Boxhall is in his quarters at this moment. He stepped back off the bridge, I think, briefly. Yes. Uh, and, the, and the time on Titanic now is approximately 11.25 p.m. Yes. And so, yes, at this late hour, yeah, it's things are just winding down. It's, and it's, uh, by this point, the uh, Californian has uh, seen the light on the horizon. Whether or not that was Titanic is still being debated, but I'm pretty... Yeah. It seems pretty clear to me that it most likely was. Yeah. And there's all kinds of uh, people just... I just think about being on this ship at this, this, this late hour. Because... Everyone here knows what it's like to be tired after a long day, especially if you're on an ocean, a transatlantic crossing, and you get all these meals and stuff. It's just going to be, you just want to go to sleep. It's going to be, you're tired was, and you uh, want to get, you want to get in bed. Yeah. It was a seemingly very, very peaceful night. Yeah, extremely. Look, look at it. Look at this right now. It's so peaceful. It's so calm. You just want to sit and you want to lay in your bed and you want to, Listen to the engines and fall asleep. And there's a lot of people, and even the people who are up at this hour and having their games and drinks and cigars, they're going to want to go to bed soon, too, you know? And, and the crew is just working like clockwork, going about their routines. And I, I often think about that, like, just what it's what it would be like to just be thrust out of this calm situation to something where suddenly the you know the the steam is roaring and all that but yeah so with all that being said titanic is 
still sailing, but somewhere far ahead of her, but getting closer, is an iceberg. And uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's coming, and they have no idea, and they won't know until it's too late. So with that in mind, we are going to uh, toss the stream over to James Panka and Matt DeWinkler in Orlando, Florida at Armas Titanic Incorporated's uh, Titanic Museum over there in Orlando. So, James, Matt, you guys go ahead and uh, take over from here, please. Thank you all.
Good evening, and welcome to Titanic's final hours in real time, live from Orlando at Titanic, the Artifact Exhibition. My name is James Penka, creative director of Titanic Honor and Glory and Titanic Project 401, as well as a researcher and spokesperson for our wonderful hosts for this weekend, RMS Titanic Incorporated. It is an absolute pleasure to uh, be sharing this evening with you, to be sharing an actual Sunday, April 14th with all of you. Um, I'm joined by uh, THG uh, cre uh, executive producer Matt DeWinkler. Say hi, Matt. Hi, everybody out there, and <laughs> hi, everyone here at Titanic, the experience. Thanks, RMST, to be here. Uh, we will soon uh, be joined by two special guests, two legends of the ocean, Rory Golden and uh, David Gallo. Um, they're about to start an adventure of their own, uh, uh, an expedition back to Titanic. Very excited to talk to them all about that. Um, but my favorite special guest this evening is this crowd in front of me. Make some noise if you're a Titanic enthusiast. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So, so happy you guys are all here. It's, it's, a, it's a full house. It's a sold out crowd. You guys all got your tickets super quick and no one else could get them. It was great. Um, all right, so tonight we will witness together the sinking of Titanic in real time through a never before seen animation by Titanic Honor and Glory. And we will discuss what is taking place as it happens. We will see it at the pace that it happened. It is such a wonderful way to experience the sinking, to see it through new eyes. And I'm so excited for you all to uh, enjoy this with us. Uh, before I jump in, I'd like to take a moment to thank Jessica Sanders and the RMS Titanic team for hosting us, Robert Friedman and Harris Solomon for their support of the event, and of course, Jack Gibson and the entire THG team for their work. This animation is uh, 10 months in the making. The text that you will read is uh, 10 years in the making. I've been refining this, uh, doing events like this over the last decade, and these models, these visuals you will see are 10 years in the making of, of refinement, and, and it's just, it is a, a masterpiece that I, I I personally think uh, that it is. Um, so uh, just a, a quick notice, uh, times are approximate. No timeline is perfect. We are using um, new research from Samuel Halpern, um, research he's been doing uh, more recently. Um, so you may see some things in a different order than you have seen before. Um, and that's just cool to see something new, a new way of looking at it. We will never truly know. As Walter Lord warned us, uh, it is a rash man indeed who would set himself up as final arbiter on all that happened the incredible night the Titanic went down. So um, let's uh, just uh, watch the animation and, and take what we can from it. So what do you say we get started? Yes. All right. Folks, 112 years ago, at this moment, the world was about to change. So let's watch. And everybody on our team who needs to start their animations at the exact same time, I am pressing play in three, two, one, press. April 14th, 1912, 11.35 p.m. The RMS Titanic, the largest ship in the world and largest movable object ever made, is just five days into her maiden voyage to New York. Two thousand two hundred and eight passengers and crew, with few exceptions, have thoroughly enjoyed the crossing thus far. This night in particular is described as the kind of night that made one feel glad to be alive. For many, a good book and a warm bed are enticing enough to end the nightly festivities and conversation. Perhaps a few linger in the first class lounge, 
much to the dismay of the stewards. Meanwhile, nearly 100 feet above the Atlantic, lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee keep watch. They have been told to keep a sharp lookout for ice. A drop in temperature has left the promenades deserted and the late hour has subdued even the transatlantic regulars. But an arrival in New York just two days out fills Titanic's corridors and cabins with anticipation. One hundred and twelve years on, one despairing fact alone pulls us back to this seemingly pleasant crossing. Titanic will not survive the night. Titanic grazes the side of an iceberg, opening small seams between her hull plates. She instantly begins taking on water. And as you may know, the experience from passenger to passenger to crewman to crewman was very different. So a few uh, examples of this. If I had a brimful glass of water in my hand, not a drop would have been spilled. John B. Thayer, first class passenger. Another first class passenger, Edward Kimball. It seemed to me like a scraping and a tearing more than a shock. It was on the starboard side of the ship under our room and the ice came in our porthole and a very different experience from Frederick Barrett. The bell rang, the red light showed. We sang out, shut the doors and there was a crash just as we sh uh, sang out. The water came through the ship's side about two feet above the floor plates, starboard side. Just 12 square feet of damage would be enough to make history. First Officer William Murdoch has already shut the watertight doors with a turn of a switch, an innovation in safety meant to make Titanic practically unsinkable. Captain Edward J. Smith steps onto the bridge. Murdoch recounts the details of the incident. And folks, we are underway. I wanted to just enjoy the animation and, the, and uh, keep it simple to the text. It's just such a calming moment just before the storm. 
Um, but now we can have a bit more of a discussion with uh, me and Matt. Matt, if you want to say hello again. Hello again, everybody. I know there's now a lot that's going to be going on 112 years ago, right now in the world of Titanic. Uh, but yes, we've done this a few times in the past, uh, relived Titanic's events live to an audience, never an audience in person, so this is quite different. Uh, I'm going yeah. to be a little very candid. Different. Yeah. Usually I'm home, sitting in front of my computer, not dressed up. I'm usually in pajamas. <laughs> a little bit is quite as comfortable as you, yes. So um, but I'm glad you're here to um, remember this event with us in person or live on YouTube watching. And we can remember it by watching this amazing animation that our team has created. Yes. Um, we will talk about what appears on screen in text um, for those of you here and those of you at home. Um, I will try to reference it as much, we will try to reference it as much as possible, but we may talk over it at some time, so please read the text on the screen. There are such important moments that we may, we may be on a tangent about something else, but um, what Lawrence Beasley just described of the engines turning off and that being the first sign of anything wrong, I cannot uh, describe to you um, how apparent that is on ships even today. Um, I've worked on cruise ships, and when the engines turn off, it wakes you up. It's, it's a wild experience. It was used quite well in the dinner show. It was. If anyone has done it here. If you've come to the dinner show in Orlando, it is a very effective moment when in the middle of dinner, the sound just turns off. It's genius. It's, uh, it, the engines turn off. It's, it's, it's a really wonderful moment to experience. Um, so um, earlier, Box Hall left the bridge to go on his inspection. We will follow him for quite a bit of this uh, early part of the sinking. Um, it's very interesting to follow these people in real time because people disappear for a while. Box Hall, you know he's on his inspections, and then maybe the next story isn't until he's loading a lifeboat, and you go, oh, that, what happened in the 30 minutes between? You know, you, they disappear, and then they come back. Chief Officer Wild is gone for a while. You know, it's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating to watch this in real time. How many of you have seen an animation of Titanic in real time before? Okay, not very many of you. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I hope everyone watching at home rose their hands in their private uh, <laughs> places. Um, so we have ice on deck. Crewmen emerge from their quarters to investigate. They return to bed cursing the iceberg for disturbing them. That is from a quote of a crewman uh, that they cursed the iceberg. And a lot of what you will read tonight um, is taken directly from survivor testimony. And yes, a lot of victim testimony as well. And we've included the person who relayed this information to the inquiries or uh, to family and friends. Um, so if you see a quote from someone you know who did not survive, that is how we know that that's what they said. Um, lamp trimmer Samuel Hemming follows a curious hissing sound originating from a tank vent pipe. His conclusion, the peak, peak tank, is flooding rapidly. So what this basically means is the peak tank, which only has water in it, and there's really no way in or out from what I know, um, it has a vent, uh, so when it fills with water, air can escape. But if air is escaping rapidly to create a hissing sound, water must be filling that tank really quickly. So we now know from that testimony that the first compartment is flooding. And we know from Barrett's testimony that boiler room six is very much flooding. So that's at least two at the moment. And we all know the design of Titanic by heart for Titanic enthusiasts. She has the number of compartments that can flood. She has the 16 watertight compartments. And she's able to stay afloat with four of those compartments, even five of those compartments. And she's designed to be hit in certain ways that will keep her afloat. And so what has happened is underwater damage, which James mentioned earlier during the, the initial impact. The way that it was hit, a sideswipe from that iceberg, it opens up just enough space. It's when they went down years later and examined the hull underneath the mud with all the technology they had, they had at the time, they were able to figure out that that amount of damage that just opened up the seams, popped the rivets, was the equivalent of about the size of a door, just 12 square feet. And that 12 square feet was enough to sink the mighty Titanic, but because it was just spread out along those six compartments, that's what doomed the ship. Absolutely. If you had a hole that was 12 feet in square, square feet of the hole, in just one of those compartments, the ship would have been perfectly safe. If you had a hole between, right on the watertight bulkhead, hitting two of those compartments, the ship also would have been able to survive. But because it was spread out, she's doomed. 
J. Bruce Ismay finds Captain Smith on the bridge and asks if the ship has been seriously damaged. Smith answers, I'm afraid she is. I've had discussions with people about that quote um, that he couldn't have possibly told Ismay that. He didn't know that the ship was seriously damaged yet. Uh, Thomas Andrews hasn't told him. But something that we have to keep in mind, seriously damaged means very different things at different times. Seriously damaged might have meant, yeah, this, a lot of paint must have been scraped off. We're going to have to fix it now. That might have been seriously damaged in that moment. Of course, they have no idea how serious it will be. Now, uh, uh, noise uh, is being created from escaping steam, and it is deafening to passengers on deck. Um, it is a poor start to what will soon be a full-scale evacuation. Passengers don't want to go out on deck because it is deafening, as Lawrence Beasley describes um, this terrible, terrible sound. If one imagines 20, life, uh, 20 locomotives blowing off steam in a low key, it would give some idea of the unpleasant sound that met us as we climbed out on the top deck. So people don't want to stay out on deck, and crewmen cannot communicate. It is not great, and this will last for a, a, quite a while. Um, and in fact, it may annoy you to listen to it, and I would turn the volume down for you in this room, but... Um, they had to listen to it, and so we have to listen to it. That is, the, that is what we do. I love this story. I had to throw uh, Washington Dodge's quote in. Two stokers who had slipped up to the promenade deck unobserved said to me, do you think there's any danger, sir? I replied, if there is any danger, it would be due to the vessel having sprung a leak, and you ought to know more about it than I. I, I love that, uh, that visual of, of that conversation taking place. Now, this steam being vented from the boilers is obviously because the boilers are now being stopped. The ship is coming to, the engines have been turned off for the last time, and all that excess steam has to go somewhere, obviously. You can't have the steam just being kept in reserve. It's very dangerous, especially in the forward compartments where you have the ice-cold Atlantic water now flooding in, getting dangerously close, getting close, touching these red-hot boilers. And so all that excess steam is going somewhere through the emergency exhaust pipes up through the funnels. This is very interesting. A lot of crewmen noticed the tarps over the cargo holds, or the cargo hatches blowing up. So air, again, like the vent pipe from the, the forepeak, air is funneling out of these cargo holds. And so these tarps are blowing up. And so multiple crewmen have seen this. And they're very curious as to why this is happening. And it must mean that there's water in the holds. So we have water in the peak tank. We have water in boiler room six, certainly. And now we uh, definitely have water going into the holds, the cargo holds. So this isn't looking great. Um, but what is looking great <laughs> is this unbelievable, these unbelievable shots that Jack uh, Gibson, our animator, our cinematic director, has put together for this animation. There's going to be some terrifying Yes, shots. it does get pretty terrifying at, at times. And it is a, a heads up to everybody, especially as the sinking goes on. It is, uh, it is quite heavy. I think it hits a little differently than the film might. I'm seeing it in real time. Um, and uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with leaving the room. Um, people at home have the option to turn it off, and um, we will not. So um, if you have to leave, that's fine. And also, if you get tired, folks, if, you, if your hotel bed is just calling your name, um, that is OK as well. Mm -hmm. You can always watch this on YouTube tomorrow. Officer Boxhall returns from his inspection, having found no evidence of damage. Clearly, he did not reach boiler room number six, where water has already reached eight feet above the floor plates. Absolutely terrifying. Boxhall did not do a great job at first. Um, he, and he, he'll make another mistake in a little bit. Yeah. But uh, He didn't get as far down as the mail room. It's now uh, 11.50, and we just saw little hints of what's to come. The mail room is flooding already, and that's where it's on Orlop deck. Um, all the mail has been stored down there, and the postal workers are getting a terrible surprise. They heard the impact. They must have heard the impact. That's right where the iceberg just shaved right by, and the water isn't flooding that room, a, a giant space down there full of mail bags, and they're going to try their struggle in vain to rescue the mail bags as the water is rising up. And now the ship's carpenter reports water in the first three holds. So folks, if you are counting along, um, that is five compartments flooded, uh, flooding. And a sixth compartment ha also has water flooding into it, uh, just not as uh, intensely as the first five. But that sixth compartment doesn't even matter because Titanic can only stay afloat with four. And so we now know from just three testimonies, from three moments in a Titanic sinking, it's only, 
11.52 at this moment, and we already know Titanic will sink. Um, they do not know that yet. We need Thomas Andrews to confirm this. Um, we haven't seen him yet um, in anyone's testimony, but I think he's, uh, he's about to appear. Um, that's part of the fun of reading testimony, going through, um, seeing when is Thomas Andrews mentioned by this person, and then when is he mentioned by this person, and can we connect a dot to say that he walked from this person to this person. It's, it's, very, it, it, it's a little puzzle that we all try to figure out. It's a riddle, as Walter Lord would have put it. And lights go out in the boiler room. Um, absolutely terrifying um, to have been down there for that moment. Um, so they will, they will look for lanterns and try to uh, uh, figure things out. So this, this uh, place that you're seeing, this space in the animation, this is the, um, the spiral stairs for the firemen to get from the fireman's tunnel that goes to the boiler rooms going up to their quarters. Um, and because the fireman's tunnel is its own sort of watertight compartment, there would be no water in it right now, but it would be pouring down into it and flooding that tunnel. Um, the Titanic is such a, a complicated puzzle of corridors and, and stairs and ladders and, and openings. Like any and, large ship. Yes. Like any large ship. So it doesn't always just flood from the bottom up, as we'll see a little bit um, from the testimony of Joseph Wheat, but that's not for uh, a, a little bit uh, to go. These are the staircases where the firemen would enter for their shifts to get to the, the boiler rooms. So they go from their, their quarters, which are located under the forecastle in the, in the bow of, of the ship, and they take those stairs up and down. And you go down to, the, to your shifts from one end and go up to the stairs on the other side. And here we go down to see the, ma the cargo holds, the, bar the baggage spaces for first and second class, which is adjacent on the other side of the ship, on the port side, right next to that mail, the, mail, the postal room, the mail rooms, which are flooding. Those two rooms, are, those two spaces are flooding. This is the postal room where all those bags are being held full of mail that the postal workers are trying to drag up from the flooding room. They just think something's wrong. They have no idea that the ship is in any danger. It's right. just something unusual. What's, what's going on yeah. in their mind? They'll the the postal know. workers are just panicking because their job just got a lot harder. Um, I love Lawrence Beasley. Uh, I think we all do. Lawrence Beasley's uh, such a perceptive person, and he noticed going down the stairs that his feet weren't landing where they should, and that was, that was the first time he noticed that something was wrong physically with the ship that um, you couldn't tell otherwise. But I think uh, if you've ever tripped on a stair, it's likely it was just a centimeter too tall. Like our, our bodies go downstairs in a very specific way. And so the fact that he noticed that is, is very, very fascinating, and he will notice so many things. Um, speaking of being perceptive, I saw someone in our chat um, has already spotted Californian on the horizon, <laughs> or a mystery ship. I forget which shot it was, but they, they saw it already. Her, her, two, her lights were visible off Titanic's port side. Yeah. Or what we assume were her lights. Um, we are about to be uh, graced with the uh, first appearance of uh, one of the most important figures in this story, of course. Um, the great Thomas Andrews. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room knows who Thomas Andrews is, but um, for those at home who are just joining us for the first time, and if you're watching a, a, a THG Titanic video or any of our Titanic content for the first time, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad you're here. Um, but, uh, but Thomas Andrews is um, the uh, chief architect of Harland and Wolfe, He's often described as Titanic's builder, the, the architect of Titanic, and um, of course he was involved. Um, Alexander Carlyle deserves a shout out though. He, uh, he really um, was a part of that process. Um, but uh, Thomas Andrews it, uh, 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 will know just with a glance uh, what is truly wrong with the ship, and he is seen on his own inspection at about this time seen by many passengers, and uh, in some testimony he's described as calming them and saying uh, in at least one testimony that Titanic could be split into multiple pieces and each would float independently. I don't know if he would say that, though. That sounds a little dramatic for me, but I guess, uh, I guess we'll never know. I'm being yelled at that I said that we, we believe that was the Californian, Is it, that it was a theory. It couldn't be any other ship. Our, our our panel of selected Titanic historians <laughs> yeah. in our, our chat. Yes, our we, have, we, have, we always have historians yeah, in our ear, re young researchers who are very passionate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they always make sure we, we say the right things. Our apologies to everybody listening if we, if we misspeak. Um, we are not. Uh, I, I have my own uh, 
qualifications, such as mm -hmm. building that room right there in 3D. This is the so. second class dining saloon. If you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful space. Uh, my personal favorite dining saloon. I think it's a, a little more, uh, it fits with modern tastes just uh, a bit more. Um, we're going to have one more text update on the screen in a second, and then I'm going to welcome our first guest to come up and speak to us, um, which is very exciting. Um, and so uh, once that appears on screen, I'll, we'll bring him up, and um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the animation and, and uh, the upcoming expedition. The order is given to prepare the lifeboats for lowering. Titanic's 14 lifeboats, two emergency cutters, and four collapsible boats provide space for roughly half of the 2,208 on board if filled to capacity. Um, unfortunately, these 20 boats are actually more than are required by law and more than Titanic will have uh, to launch before the night is over. So folks, our first guest this evening is a diver, a historian. Uh, he has visited uh, Titanic's wreck site three times, um, has seen Titanic with his own eyes, um, Mr. Rory Golden, everybody. So Rory, you can sit on down over there and, and take that mic. Rory is here, as, as a lot of us are, for the speaker series, the annual speaker series here in uh, Orlando. He was here last year. I was lucky enough to meet him last year, and uh, I saw his talk last year, saw his talk this year. Um, absolutely wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Rory. Thank you for inviting me here. Absolutely. Um, so my, my first question for you, we, we have, um, we'll, we'll try to keep in touch with what's going on on screen, but always, you know, read the text. Um, but um, please tell people why you are here for this speaker series. You know, why, why are people so interested to hear what you have to say? Um, apart from telling bad jokes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> which apparently I have a reputation for now internationally. Um, <laughs> I've been lucky to have been on many expeditions over the last 24 years to the Titanic. It started in August 2000 when I made my first dive and uh, that expedition took place over six weeks and uh, just over 800 artifacts were recovered uh, from the seabed and around the wreck site. Um, and it gave me a whole new insight into the whole story of the Titanic. Um, the inanimate objects are things that we can directly relate to because they are pieces of the wreck, whether they are tools or, or uh, furniture fittings. But it was the personal belongings that we recovered. Uh, the stories of, of those are the things that became much more real um, for me and for everybody else on the, on the expedition. Things like personal belongings of young 17-year-old Edgar Andrew mm -hmm. uh, from Argentina who perished. His suitcase was, was recovered with, with his personal clothing in it. Officer Murdoch's um, uh, case was found with his you know, belongings, his pipe, his razor, mm -hmm. brushes. Uh, the famous story of Marion Meanwell in her alligator bag who wasn't supposed to be on the ship she was transferred from another ship because of the coal strike and the story of the coal strike with Titanic's maiden voyage wasn't going to be delayed so they removed coal from other ships. She was transferred. She wasn't meant to travel but she did and she didn't survive. Um, the famous story of the, the perfume samples. Uh, Adolf Salfeld traveling from Manchester who was a perfume salesman who was bringing his wares over to New York to sell to the big department stores and he survived the sinking and 83 years later he brought up his perfume files and glass cases that somehow and miraculously withstood the huge pressure down there and literally that evening the laboratory came to life with the smells from 1912. So all these small threads make a whole big picture for people like me and others to share. Absolutely. And it's, it's so wonderful to uh, hear it from someone who actually experienced that. You know, the, I think a lot of people have, have heard of the perfume vials because of an emotional clip of, of Bill Sauter talking yes. about it. And, and, and Bill, Bill you know, sums it up perfectly. Yeah, he does. 
um, and and to know that you uh, collected these things and, and and helped bring them to the the exhibits and and to the world is pretty special. Have you have you ever watched a real time sinking of Titanic before? I haven't. And is it? I mean, it it's just started, but has it? Uh, impressed upon you any any feelings? No, it's it's um, the sense of calmness at this stage is mm. is interesting and based on the eyewitness accounts that you so far are showing and talking about, I mean, I imagine it was like that at the very beginning. You know, it was a nuisance yeah. to some people, and the shock hadn't hadn't registered yet, uh, and that's quite obvious. Yeah, and seeing this, this big screen in front of me showing the uh, the situation um, developing and unfolding I think will give a true representation of what it probably was like yeah it's as, as close as we can get and you know we've this is our third time doing this and every year we we feel a little a little bit closer and a little bit closer so you are going on an expedition to Titanic um, uh, and uh, this uh, coming up in the next few months and uh, uh, I, I can't imagine what the preparation is like, but is there, could you share with everybody in this room and everybody watching on YouTube, um, what are you looking forward to the most um, about it? And it doesn't have to be Titanic related, it might just be ship life related. What are you looking forward to coming up uh, with this expedition? I'm, I'm very comfortable at sea on, on deep ocean expeditions. It's something I've got very used to, and it, it takes a certain type of mindset. Um, probably a bit crazy sometimes, yeah. but um, <laughs> you have to have a mindset to be able to focus on, on being at sea where you're you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from land where, you know, as, I, as I referred to yesterday, you can't go out to the shops to get a tube of toothpaste right. that you might have forgotten. But the focus is on, is on this year, is on surveying the wreck with the latest and greatest in, in high resolution imaging systems. And the man who's doing that is Evan Kovac, who I've known from previous expeditions, such as on the um, Apollo Moon Rocket project that I was involved with. And Evan has also been very actively involved in diving to the Britannic over the last number of years, and he brings that knowledge with him as well. So between him and the other experts, such as David Gallo, who will be up later on, and um, people on the ship itself, a man called Troy Lanay, who again, who is a deep ocean uh, operator. There's a great team of people coming on board this to try to bring the latest surveying activities to, to the front and who knows what we might see with all this new imaging systems and what we may discover. We do know that the wreck is deteriorating, that's just a natural thing that's happening anyway. Um, and the last number of years I've seen that myself in terms of, of um, the uh, previous expeditions that have been on over the n over the last 20 years, and Titanic is is integrating. It's a matter of time. It's just nature taking its course, and the laws of of natural uh, wastage. So, I'm looking forward to seeing what we can actually discover, and we will discover new things. There's no doubt about that. Absolutely. Um, before I ask this uh, this next uh, question, um, in a moment, uh, it is it is now 12:05. Uh, AM Titanic time and uh, for those of you who need to know because I know you're dying to know um, Titanic was two hours and two minutes ahead of New York time, but don't forget to factor in daylight savings So at this time uh, uh, Deck hands are seen beginning the laborious process of uncovering and preparing Titanic's lifeboats um, This will take some time. I mean we we already have in the animations uh, plenty of lifeboats swung out uh, Perhaps a little too quickly um, the process did take a while. There were a lot of steps um, to go along um, Rory, you you brought something with you that you wanted to uh, to read, I believe. If you, I, if you like I do, to. I do. Thank you for letting me do this. Oh, I have a um, a little message which I'm going to read out from a very good friend of mine, uh, Michael Martin, from Cove, Queenstown, in Cork, Titanic's last port of call. And Martin, Michael was a uh, a man responsible for organizing the memorial plaque that I placed on the wreck in my first dive in 2000 from, from, from Cove. And also he is the creator of the Titanic Trail, which is a walking trail around Cove town. Um, 
inappropriate locations giving the history of those particular areas. I just need to get my glasses out. Sure. I've actually I've, I've done the walking trail in, in Cove. Uh, visited there two years ago um, and had, uh, you know, it's like a very emotional experience. That whole, that whole city, that whole town, it's hard to call it a city. It's, it's, uh, what so you may so not know is that the trail was opened in 1998 and it was officially opened by the late great Titanic explorer Ralph White. Mm. He was a great friend of mine and many others. Here. We've been hearing his name a lot this weekend uh, here at the, in Orlando. But go ahead. Yeah, what, what, do, you, what do you have to read okay, for? Okay, so <clears throat> it reads, It is with the deepest respect that myself and the staff of the Titanic Trail in Cove, Ireland, extend our fondest remembrance to all those lost on RMS Titanic. In the days following the tragedy in 1912, local citizens, port officials, mail inspectors and maritime crews were shocked and mourned the loss of people that had been in their midst just a few days before. Of the 123 passengers who embarked at Cove, only 44 survived. As the ship sailed away from Ireland to the strain of Aaron's Lament played by Eugene Daly on his Ilon pipes, little did people know how appropriate that title would be just three and a half days later. There is a 112 year difference that extends across the ocean and the decades between the people and places of RMS Titanic's last port of call. To this day, right here in what has, was then known as Queenstown, the heartfelt loss of the ship and respectful memorising of this great maritime tragedy continues. And it's signed Dr. Michael Martin, author and creator of the Titanic Trail in Cove. Wonderful. Thank you for bringing that. That was... Oh. Um, it, it's, it's a very fun... I mean, it's a, not, fun is, of course, not the right word. It's a, it's a special occasion that we all get to come together and... and I think every organization, every uh, uh, even just every YouTube channel has, seems to have a, a special commemoration today and this week. Um, Titanic Week is now Titanic Month for us. I mean, it, uh, we're, we're all doing so much. Some of us have not slept uh, because of how much is going on. Um, so my next question for you um, as we uh, continue to watch lifeboats get prepared. Um, part of the reason I'm bringing Rory up at this point um, is there's there's not too much happening at the moment. I mean, of course, there's so much going on, but in, in w survivor testimony, um, usually you get a lot of stories of people being woken up, a lot of stories of people being told what happened, and then suddenly they're boarding life, or you know, they're on deck, and there's a, a gap in there where they're just getting dressed, and that takes a while. Um, so as a as a diver, um, I, I know you're you're a, a, a Titanic historian, and, and you have a, a, a love of Titanic, of course, but um, what uh, I, I assume I know this answer, but are you more drawn to the wreck, more drawn to Titanic post sinking, or is this just as fascinating and interesting to you? Because um, I knew I, growing up, I was all about this story of the sinking, but I never was a wreck person. You know, um, I, I, I was more interested in, in the Titanic when she was afloat. Do you have sort of a bias to one side or the other? Well, my interest in shipwreck started in my early years of diving, and the first thing was the thrill of trying to find a wreck. But part of that process was the research, and the research would take, and this is in the days before having GPS satellites and, mm -hmm. and boats with all the latest high-tech <laughs> equipment for sonar. Yeah. Um, it was all handheld compasses. Oh, I sound really old now, don't I? Uh, <laughs> Handheld compasses, oh, back in those days. Um, you, had to, you had to dive uphill both directions to the right, <laughs> yeah. But I had to go and do research on these things. Right. And I would go into libraries, and I would go into local offices, and I would talk to local fishermen, and dig up the newspapers of the day. I would spend hours in the National Library of Dublin, I would travel to Kew to the public records office in London on occasions. And that's when th 
the stories would start to grow in your mind mm-hmm. and the whole history and the stories of the people. So it, they're all tangibly linked together. It isn't just about an item that sank for whatever reason and lay on the seabed and people died. It's the stories behind it all. And the Titanic is the biggest story of them, of them all in terms of global um, uh, uh, recognition. I mean, let's not forget that there have been greater tragedies at sea since Titanic. But this particular tragedy caught a moment in time at the peak of, of as was said earlier today, the, the Edwardian era, um, the obvious differences in, in the class status of the passengers on board and how they appear to be discriminated against based on the proportion of survivors against those who didn't survive. So it isn't just more than the thrill of finding a wreck and diving to mm-hmm. it and looking at it. It's, it is the story behind it and the stories of the people behind it. And they're all part of the same thing. Absolutely. Um, folks, that shot that just ended, that long zoom in to Titanic with the ice, um, I paused the video when I first saw it. Um, so just a little shout out to Jack for that shot. It, it's absolutely stunning. Speaking of Jack, the gentleman who animated this video, he doesn't um, uh, know um, the, uh, the, the names of the speaker series uh, as much. And so when I said um, Rory Golden will be joining us, um, you know, some of the team might not know your name. But I, I just got a message from Jack, all caps, I love Rory. <laughs> so um, he's, he's a big fan. Um, and now he's going to be super embarrassed that I said that. Um, I love this quote. Uh, uh, oh, I, I missed it. But uh, we are in the north and have struck a berg. Um, that, of course, is said by a victim of Titanic, but relayed to us from uh, his wife who recounted that. Um, so... Um, we are uh, getting closer to the end. We still have, we still have some time with you. Um, I suppose, um, uh, what else, what, what do you usually do on an April 14th? I mean, we, we've been doing th- these animations for years. Um, I've been doing um, real-time things going back to MySpace, believe it or not. I used to post on MySpace uh, every hour what was happening on Titanic at the time. So what what would you, if it wasn't for the speaker series and it wasn't for this event, what would you usually do on an April 14th? Well, I was here last year. Right, of course. <laughs> uh, and then the previous years, I've been in Belfast and I've been in Cove. Um, a combination of events, you know, around those times. So I've been I've been invited to, to participate and speak at some of these events. So I've also just attended them uh, in an, in, a, in an ordinary capacity, if you like. So I have been around the sights and the sounds of, of where Titanic was on, on the island of Ireland. And, um, you know, I've, I've, that's, that's where I've been. I've never been anywhere else right. apart from that. Yeah, um, being Irish, I, I can imagine, connects you to Titanic just a bit more than it might for me, someone from Cleveland, Ohio, who, <laughs> I mean, a lot of people on Titanic were I coming to I think there's a Dublin in Ohio. Isn't there, there is, there yeah, is yeah. Dublin, Ohio. That's right. <laughs> good, good. Um, so, folks, around this time, uh, the ship's orchestra, led by band leader Wallace Hartley, begins playing music to keep uh, passengers calm. And little do they know, these men are beginning uh, one of the most famous music concerts in history. Um, it, it's a sort of an interesting way to think about it that uh, these men have, have no idea that um, this, this concert of theirs, this performance, will stick with us for the rest of time. Captain Smith tells Marconi Telegraph operators John Phillips and Harold Bride to stand by. They will need to send a CQD, the distress call of the time, but not just yet. We're still waiting for the official word. Um, so, Rory, before we let you go and you're welcome to stick around and watch the the animation or maybe get to sleep i i understand both i i i'd love to get to sleep right now um is there anything else you'd like to to tell us about um your experiences uh, um at the rec site or or uh, experiences you're hoping to have at the rec site um i think Probably a lot of people now know about the, the find that I was lucky to make on my oh, first yes. dive. Please tell us about and this. It was significantly historically um, amazing because the task, usually when you, when, when you go on these dives, there are certain targets that you're, you're assigned to see if you can locate. 
And the target we had been given, myself and Ralph, was to look for the builder's plate. Uh, because during that expedition, the, 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 the base of the plate, uh, the timber plate, the oval plate, uh, had been discovered. And the thought was, well, if we found the, found the base, the plate must be there somewhere. So we literally spent two hours just below the bridge on that deck where the plate was and it was one of those days where the, I mean the currents down there can be vicious they can just suddenly turn and they can be very very fast but on this particular day there was no current and we spent two hours in the one spot because the robotic arm every time it went in to sift through the debris and the dirt brought up a plume of, of right. dust and dirt and it didn't settle and we had to wait maybe 20 minutes at a time or 15 20 minutes at a time and then peer out through the port windows to see could we see anything and eventually after two hours we had to frustratingly give up and go look for for other items and as a result of that we were we were um, destined to remain on the bow section of the, of the ship and we traveled around it and found a few other pieces of, of interest but nothing major and eventually our time was running out after nine and a half hours and um, we took one lock one last glide along the, the the starboard side officer's deck and I just saw something out of the corner of my eye on in a pile of debris and it was a semicircular shape and I knew that it had to be something significant because it, it was out of place it was incongruous I mean things like that just catch your eye and it's something I've been lucky to have developed or was just had an eye for over over my years on and, and looking for things on, on the seabed and as I was looking through the the window Ralph was looking th on the on the video monitor and I said do you see what I see and he said yep <laughs> and I said what do you think it is and I he said I think we've just redeemed ourselves meaning we had found something significant and the robotic arm reached out and picked up this piece and what it was was the the main helm stand or the helm stand with the main wheel of the titanic that was in the, from the wheelhouse that was the internal wheelhouse that was attached to the telemotor which went through went through the the compass and then into the telemotor and the tally motor then transferred the wheel power to the open wheel, uh, wheel uh, the bridge area. So, but this was the main wheel that quartermaster Robert Hitchens had been standing at when the ship struck the iceberg, but, uh, as he was given the order to turn hard to starboard. So, this in the sinking had somehow got ripped off. I mean, that alone tells you the forces of destruction that were taking place. Uh, the whole bridge area was built of timber, so all that got ripped off in the sinking. The tally motor was the only thing that survived, and even the fact that that survived shows how strong it, it is, because if the shaft got ripped off from the tally motor, I mean, think of those forces. Yeah. And somehow it ended up on the deck, not on the seabed away from the ship. And as it was pulled out, and it was a unique, it was different from the Olympic because it had a an A-frame stand and the boss, the center section went through it and the shafts were still attached to it and there were three stumps of the wooden wheel. That was another extraordinary thing because wood like that would have deteriorated over time but because it was buried within debris, it had survived. And that was put into the basket and Three hours later, we were back on the surface and we got out. And um, Bill Sauter was there and he was very excited. I'm sure. Um, but the rule, the rule of the expedition was that nobody touched any artifacts until the crew got out who had recovered them. And Ralph stood back and he said, you saw it, you touch it. And I was the first person to touch the wheel of the Titanic since it went down all those years before. And amazingly, when we took it out of the basket, it was so well packed with grease 
it still rotates oh in its bearings. God. Wow. And that was a great tribute to the Harlan and Wolf um, shipyard where they had greased it up so well. Yeah. And also to the manufacturers, Brown Brothers of, of Scotland. Absolutely. And I know you love saying this, but where can people find this artifact on display? Sorry? I, w I know you love to say this. Where where can people find this wheel on display? I, I don't know. Do you know? The, uh, the uh, uh, famous <laughs> port city of Las Vegas. <laughs> the famous maritime city yeah, of yeah, Las Vegas. Yeah, maritime city. That's right. That's what you say. Well, uh, Rory, thank you for joining us. I, for one, actually love the, the bad jokes, so uh, I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, folks, round of applause for Rory Golden. <laughs> All right, folks, a lot has happened in, in the last few minutes, aside from us having the pleasure of, of, of hearing from Rory. Um, it is now April 15th, 1912. Thomas Andrews is making his way to the bridge. People see him and he looks worried. Other passengers describe his face as, as uh, being white. Um, things are not looking good on that front. Um, we've also had uh, people being told, uh, passengers being told to go up on deck. One steward telling a passenger, no, you have time for nothing, which is just, oh, that, those words always hit me uh, uh, very, very hard. Um, and then a, a passenger, an unknown second-class passenger, uh, Lawrence Beasley describes as saying, you don't catch me uh, leaving a warm bed to go up on that cold deck at midnight. I know better than that. Um, a, a, a wild quote, uh, uh, but um, hopefully, hopefully he did leave that warm bed at some point. Um, Matt, you've been gone for a while. Oh, wait, before Matt, um, this quote. Turn out, you fellows. You have a half hour to live. That is from Mr. Andrews. Keep it to yourself and let no one know. Um, is just such a, an incredible uh, quote. Um, of course, uh, I guess one last thing that we did uh, also miss is Andrews did tell Captain Smith um, that uh, the ship is sinking. Um, and he, of course, says famously, an hour, two at most. And it's uh, pretty remarkable that this is a kind of a pessimistic uh, diagnosis. Titanic will last a, a bit longer than Andrews says, which is just a testament to um, his ship. Matt, how are you doing over there? Oh, I'm fine, yes. <laughs> I enjoyed my break, and hearing Rory's story yeah. uh, was wonderful. So, again, thank you, Rory. But, yes, and a testimony to Harlan and Wolf, the builders. Um, Andrews is perhaps just being overly cautious, giving that hour to at the most diagnosis for his ship. Uh, Titanic lasts much longer, as we know. Well, he also probably con has to consider that she may capsize at some point. Oh, I mean, like many ships, like most bo ships boats, do. Most, mo bo most ships uh, capsize. It's really remarkable, and, and we're so used to Titanic. I, I mean, Titanic was the first shipwreck I ever saw as a child, like it being recreated in a film. Um, so I just assume that's how ships sink. But um, it is remarkable that Titanic sank at such an even keel. Uh, it... it to, to prolong the sinking, to allow more lives uh, to survive and to allow more stories to survive um, really adds to um, the, the sort of the magic of this event. Um, there's so many moments like that in the sinking. When, when we get back to exterior shots, right now you're seeing the end result of the mailroom now completely submerged. The, the postal workers had tried to lift these heavy mailbags now a mail sack full of, of letters is heavy on its own, but if it's soaking wet, it's upwards of hundreds of pounds. Now, they first had to lift those bags off the racks, soaking wet, drag them up from uh, G deck to F deck, and then F deck was starting to flood, so they didn't um, brought them up to E deck into an empty first class cabin, and then that all was just washed away. All their hard work is it, the water rose higher and higher, but what? perfect shot right here what we wanted to see is now you of course the the ship is listing uh of course you have the list towards the bow because the water is flooding in the bow but as james mentioned most ships capsize because the water floods in in ways that is difficult to comprehend but initially titanic had a uh, list to starboard because the damage was on the starboard side but we're going to see throughout the night titanic takes on a a, a capsizing almost port list mm -hmm. that gets more and more extreme to the point that the crew, I believe it's uh, Chief Officer Wild at one point, even commands all the passengers and crew on deck that he can see to run over to the other side of the ship to try to correct that list. 
And this port list, which we'll see, gets in the way of launching lifeboats. It makes it difficult for passengers on the port side to get over the gap into the lifeboats, and it makes it even more difficult for some lifeboats to be lowered on the on the starboard side. It's it just all these factors make it more and more surprising that anyone thought that these lifeboats would be helpful in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's amazing how small of a list can render a lifeboat somewhat useless. Um, we have our first wireless message at this moment, CQD, D-E-M-G-Y, and then the position. For those of you who aren't aware, CQD is uh, uh, the distress call of the time, as we mentioned earlier, um, and then M-G-Y is Titanic's call sign. Um, DE being, you know, of, so uh, a distress call from Titanic and the position. And as the text mentioned earlier, um, this position that was given to uh, Phillips and Bride to send out um, was roughly 20 nautical miles west of Titanic's actual location. The exactly. first distress call is received by the Frankfurt, Mount Temple, and La Provence. Um, that's my French for you. Um, uh, none are close enough to reach Titanic in time for rescue. And does everyone know what CQD stands for? Oh, yep. Yeah, I, I heard. I heard a couple answers. Oh, yeah. I heard one correct answer. Yeah. Uh, it's often believed that CQD stands for "Come Quickly Distressed" or "Come Quick Distressed," but the CQ is just you might you might hear it in movies and old time pictures, but CQ, calling CQ, CQ, which generally means like attention, 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 all stations, attention, yeah. so listen to this message. The D is for distress. So CQ, attention, all stations, listen to this message, something important, distress. Absolutely. Um, and then, of course, we also missed a, a bit ago at 1225. We're now getting closer to 1228. So about three minutes ago, the evacuation of Titanic officially uh, began. Um, women and children are being loaded into lifeboats, but it's still super calm. This is a third class space that we're looking at right now. This is, you know, forward of the ship. That's a, a, a cargo hatch. Mm -hmm. um, the cargo hatches were not full trunks on, on all four sides. At each deck, they opened up. Um, and this is sort of forward Scotland Road. That uh, staircase going up on the left would go up to the third class open space. Um, and then the uh, stairs on, uh, in front of it would go down to more cabins. Uh, James mentions that the evacuation of Titanic has begun and the alerting of all the passengers, but one thing that we don't see in our animations, because it's difficult to visualize really, is that the third class passengers in the bow of Titanic, uh, who are awakened from the impact, from the, the iceberg collision, don't just hear it, they, they really feel it. Mm -hmm. Not just the vibrations, the rattling of the iceberg, but they're soon going to be encumbered by all this ice cold water which rises and they evacuate rather quickly to the stern of the ship and a lot of them take all their worldly possessions with them because like most on Titanic they don't know what is going on they just think oh there's there's some water flooding into my room and many of the crew were laughing at the you know making fun as they're watching the third class passengers going by their quarters because the crew are woken up and they don't they're angry at the situation and of course, being the day that it was, they're just looking at these, these, these third-class men, mostly from the forward section, all wet, with their bags, saying, look at these cra this crazed group of Italians running by. Um, Italians was just everyone's go-to phrase at the that, time. That was the, the racism that of the day. That was the yes. racism of the day. Just Acting, anybody who, mm -hmm. who had slightly darker skin, that, Italians. I, I, yeah. I'm Italian, but I wish I had the, the nice complexion. But <laughs> uh, yeah, they're acting crazy, crying, and jumping. Um, we saw the, the lights of a mystery ship in the distance that will be there for the rest of the night. And might I point out that the, the steam is still escaping from the tops of the funnels. It is still an unpleasant place to be outside. In fact, um, the, the people we're hearing from right now, John Phillips and Harold Bride in the, the wireless room, they had a hard time hearing messages from other ships. Uh, you know, cannot hear for noise of steam. Is, is uh, for, In fact, I, I assume it will appear on screen at some point. Um, uh, and folks, uh, uh, if you wanted to know what um, MGY looks like in Morse code, um, I, I guess I can't take my jacket off, but I, I have a tattoo on my arm of it. <laughs> so um, if, you, if you need to know, if, you, if you're ever in need of, of MGY, uh, just come, come to me. What a um, weird shout out to your, your arm muscles. Yes. Yeah, my lack, lack thereof. Yes. I, I am a uh, video gamer. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
very strong, yeah, very strong are, uh, hands, so, yeah. very strong, yeah. Um, so um, <laughs> as, we, as we continue on, we're all, it's almost time to bring out um, our, our next guest, but this quote, we've dressed in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. Benjamin Guggenheim, how many people have heard that quote before? Of course, pretty much everybody. How many people assumed it happened way later in the evening? It is, it is one of those quotes that um, we uh, attribute with happening so late in, in the evening because that's, it's a heroic quote. But that quote comes to us from Henry Etches, who boards one of the first, if not the first, lifeboat. Um, and so we know that that had to have happened early in the sinking, which opens up the possibility that maybe this wasn't I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to create new right conspiracies. Track, yes. oh, no, but, you're, no, you're not. But this it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, it's 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 depicted as this heroic man. Um, I'm going to go down with the ship, dressed in my best. Was he joking? Was he was he poking fun? Oh yeah. Uh, there was a, at another point, uh, Guggenheim stopped another steward, telling him telling him to tell his wife in New York that I played the game straight to the end and that no woman was left beho- left on board this ship because Ben Guggenheim was a coward. Tell her that my last thoughts will be with her and the and our girls. So, mm. was he just going around telling everybody he possibly could that you know, here I am, I'm being manly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's no matter, interesting. Yeah, it's no matter how you 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 play it, he's still being dapper. You know, if you want to take the route of filling up the space of uh, taking away all the space of a boat, you know, a woman in a lifeboat like J. Bruce Ismay, you know, the cowardly, the villains, etc. Uh, he still perished that night. So. Right. It's interesting. It we've we've um, we've accepted certain Titanic narratives, and uh, we have no idea what is true and what is not. It's just sometimes interesting to to turn them on their heads and just see what what else could possibly be there. Um, so, folks, it's time for our our uh, other guest this evening. Um, he is an oceanographer, um, and he is co-leading the expedition to Titanic this uh, uh, in, in this in the near future. Um, please welcome. Dr. David Gallo. Thank you, thank you. David, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Um, how, how have you felt about, the, have, you, have you watched a real-time sinking before? I've not seen the real-time sinking, nor have I seen Jim Cameron's movie. <laughs> you have not. I have not. That is wild. Um, that is that is pretty wild. So this is this is very interesting for you. Then it's it's a very different experience um, yeah, to, very, to see uh, a recreation like this. Very much so, and uh, also very emotional. Yes. The, the, the reason that I haven't watched it is because working with the real imagery, I don't want this to impact. What Absolutely. I see. Well, as soon as we're done here, you can you can head off to bed, and, and <laughs> you can you can go I, back to I, to, I, to that. And you have to excuse me. I've got my allergies that are really kick acting up. So, oh, that's all my right. Voice is a bit out. No worries. Thank you so much for joining us. Regardless, um, can you, uh, uh, like I asked Rory, could you tell um, our audience at home? A lot of people here have been here for the speaker series, and they've heard you talk all weekend, and the talks have been wonderful. Um, but for our, our viewers at home, um, uh, why um, why are you so uh, important in our in our little community here? Well. Um, I came to Woods Hole at the invitation of Bob Ballard right after he discovered Titanic. And so I've lived with the imagery from the beginning and, and about, uh, I've lived with the, our thoughts about the wreck since 1985, 86. Uh, and at that time, I had just finished my PhD, which was uh, mapping the seafloor, making maps of the mountains and rivers and valleys. So this was kind of out of my range of uh, things that I was interested in. and. Uh, one thing I'm always interested in uh, is uh, stories, being able to tell a story to the public about the sea, about the ocean. Uh, and here's a great story. I had a little bit of a break between my research as a uh, student and my research that would be uh, as a uh, uh, freshly minted PhD. And so I started to get interested in Titanic, mostly in the technology to begin with. Uh, because in the academic world, we didn't have what Bob Ballard had, these uh, robots and these cameras. And uh, I was amazed by this. And little by little, as you know, Titanic, if it finds a little way to get it into your brain, it does. And Titanic certainly grabbed, grabbed a hold of me. Wonderful. Um, Ed, you, you mentioned stories. Um, uh, Titanic, obviously, the source of so many. I mean, we're watching 
the, the whole story right now, but there's so many other stories that, and people like you and Rory are the reason we have some of these stories. Um, one story that I'd love to just take a minute and mention, because it comes up later, John Jacob Astor, the richest man aboard Titanic, is about to board lifeboat number seven with his wife, Madeline, but suddenly draws back from the small boat. For now, he will choose the safety of the 46,000 ton ship. This will, of course, come into play later on. Um, David, uh, you're, you're co-leading the expedition with uh, your, and your chief morale officer is, of course, Rory. So, um, well, oh, and, and before I ask this question, we have reached Carpathia. This is a conversation between Carpathia and Titanic. Just as it happened, um, Carpathia was just checking in with Titanic to ask a simple question and uh, ended up being a very important uh, question to ask, um, even though uh, it, the, the question doesn't even get answered. Um, but, uh, but my question for you, um, what will you be doing on this expedition? What is a what is a co what is a leader of an expedition yeah, what responsible the, for? Uh, Jessica will be there uh, as well, co-leader, and a guy named Troy Launig will be there. Uh, so we've got essentially four with Rory, four uh, of us. And what you want to do, you have a goal in mind that you've I identified, and you want to make sure everything is running smoothly so that. Uh, the, the robot's doing what you expect the robot to do. Uh, the cameras are working properly. The sonar is working properly. And it's, a, it's an all day long. Uh, you, people like to say, w are you 12 on, 12 off, or 4 on, 8 off, or 8 mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. off? And truthfully, it's, you're just on until you pass out and then you wake up and get going again. Uh, so it's it's difficult. It's uh, incredibly exciting. More than once, I've had to make people go to sleep uh, because they've been awake for days at a time. So uh, I'm I'm real. I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to that. Great. Um, we look forward to hearing more about it and and seeing what you guys can can uh, uh, capture on film. And uh, it's going to be wonderful. Um, so I asked it, uh, Rory this, but um, so you, you sort of, uh, we've been listening to your talks all weekend, you sort of came at tit uh, Titanic from a diving perspective. Right. Um, so do you have a certain bias towards, um, like, are you the kind of, uh, do you have the interest in Titanic to be reading the stories and reading the books, or um, is it pretty scientific for you? I wouldn't say it's scientific. I think it's, again, more about the story. I wouldn't call myself a, a Titanic aficionado, or, a, but it has, uh, as I said, there's so many stories that I can't help myself uh, but be interested in it. So I may pick a certain thing out uh, during the night and go on one of those YouTube adventures yeah. where I end up uh, looking at asparagus growth in, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in Australia. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Every single night I look at the map of the earth on a program called uh, marinetraffic.com and it shows you uh, all the ships at sea, uh, many of them, 100,000 I guess in, at some times. And I look at that, and I'm always wondering what's going on at that ship right now. What's the weather like? What's the sea like? And, uh, you know, Titanic, I m many, many times focus on Titanic mm -hmm. uh, and the energy coming from Titanic. And, it's, uh, you know, as I said, it, the... the uh, been out at sea with people that have been there many times and the emotions and the energy from that site, because when you're at the surface, not much i mean that's the spot on the planet but the water is different but still you know that under those stars that this all played played right. out this powerful thing in one spot on the planet so. um it's interesting you mentioned the, the 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 mapper website to see hundreds of thousands of ships um, in the ocean as we get our first lifeboat launching by the way uh, contains 28 floating capacity 65 we'll talk more about floating capacity i'm, I'm i love um, when, when we do these things, when I talk about Titanic, I love to make sure the word floating is in front of the word capacity. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but this first lifeboat is being lowered. Um, but Titanic has been sinking for one hour at this point. It is now 1240. Uh, roughly 28 passengers and crew have been evacuated, while 2,180 lives, roughly, remain on board. Most unaware their time is running short. Uh, but you mentioned that, that mapper website. I would love to see a, uh, a ship mapper website from this night and compare it. You know, obviously, yes. probably so many more ships today. Yes. Yep. But what's, what's really astounding about the Titanic story is that 
um, for the time period, the ships were covered in sh the, the, the traffic was madness. And so for, um, for Titanic, like at this moment, uh, 112 years ago right now, Captain Smith might not really be sweating too much. Obviously, it's a terrible thing what's happening, but no. there's bound to be a ship nearby. Sure. And if he could open that cruise mapper, or uh, I, I say cruise mapper because I go on cruise mapper, which has all the cruise ships on yeah. it. Um, you know, it's it's uh, they probably expect many ships nearby, and we're seeing in this animation, um, Jack has done an incredible job bringing ships like the Baltic into our animation for the first time this year, to just highlight how far these ships are um, from each other. Um, what are you looking forward to most for this expedition this year? Well, we're going, uh, it's very exciting to me, and I keep thinking, I retired from Woods Hole some years ago, and so now just doing projects that still uh, really interest me deeply. Titanic, of course, is the top of that list. We're going with an incredible team of people uh, that uh, I think each one of them at the pinnacle of the, what they do, uh, Evan Kovacs with his cameras, Troy with his operational experience, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line. And uh, people that, Rory, uh, people that have uh, a, a disposition that's wonderful. Because when you're at sea, you're stuck on this tiny little <laughs> uh, spot yeah. with people and, and typically uh, dealing with Titanic, and not just Titanic, but also scientific it, it draws the ego driven people out of the woodwork so being at sea like that can be challenging uh, so i'm interested in that but the technology we're going with uh, cameras 8k cameras uh, two different robots so we can look at one robot uh, they can see each other mapping doing what they do and they're going to be uh, with lasers too, LIDAR. So you'll see this flickering light out, out ahead of them. In my mind, I can see that light moving across the deck of the ship. Uh, so that to me, and watching slowly as uh, those two vehicles paint the Titanic on the seafloor. Um, every, and our, you know, our goal has always been to, you can't really, uh, RMS Titanic Inc. is in a way the curator of that site. Right. And how can you manage something if you don't really know what's there and what disposition, you know, what's, what's going on with that item? So uh, it's important for us to know the bounds of the, of the wreck site. Where does it begin? Where does it end? And what's, it, what's there and what's it look like? How, uh, how uh, much intact or not intact is that object? Um, just to give everybody a bit of insight into our research team, I said just a minute ago that I would love to see a map of the ships in the ocean that night, and three people just sent me one that they made themselves. You know, they're, they're just, <laughs> this research team, I, I, you can send our research team, uh, there it is, he's got it on there. You can send, oh, that's great. It's, they're a really, they're, they're, a, they're a crack team, as they say. Yeah. Um, uh, they, uh, I one time posted a picture of Titanic, a black and white photo, and I said, hey, do we know what day this was taken? I'm sure someone said it. I could probably look it up, but you guys will get it to me quicker. What, what, what day was this taken? Is this Thursday in Southampton? And somebody said, you know, the exact day and the exact time based on the shadows of the sun. I was like, gosh, Fantastic. you guys, you can't, you can't. You um, know, one of the ships you mentioned early, uh, Mount Temple. Yes. Uh, went on, let's see, 1912, 1919, sorry. It was carrying some very rare dinosaur bones from Canada to the British Museum. And it was sunk by a German raider halfway across the Atlantic. And one of the things on my bucket list, and uh, there's a p group of people that for a long time have wanted to find that vessel and to recover those dinosaurs. So there's this tie-in with Titanic that that I really, uh, really enjoy. Oh, yeah. Um, so artifacts are obviously um, a big part of what we do uh, at RMS Titanic Incorporated at these exhibits. And we'll take a quick moment to enjoy this moment. Uh, uh, we have our first distress rocket launched. Um, pretty stunning, stunning stuff. Um, and the band is still playing. So, uh, so yes, the, the artifacts are a big part of it. And you talked earlier today, I believe, or maybe it was yesterday, um, about um, what, how, what you feel about the artifacts. Why, why for you, are, are, are they so important? Um, yeah, that, that, I guess that's the question. Why, why, why are yeah. these artifacts so important? Uh, because to me, authentic uh, experience is, uh, is important. Yeah. And... Uh, 
Because these objects that you see here were there on board that ship on that night yeah. and have lived through that event. I do believe that, uh, in my mind at least, that these objects have a certain power to them. I'm not going too far out <laughs> into the <laughs> wild world, but, you know, again, having been there. And otherwise, you have to uh, look over the shoulders of a James Cameron or a Bob Ballard or even a Dave Gallo or Rory. I think that that to me is a very personal uh, experience that you can have with Titanic. How do you feel about that particular thing that you're looking at? And I, I did the same walking through uh, the, the exhibit to to here tonight. Is that you stop and look at these things and wonder uh, what where it came from and what was going on and. Uh, so to me, it's a very important part of the story to have that. You've got to have the ship beneath the sea, the mystery still there. Uh, Jim Cameron spinning stories or, or anybody, uh, you know, Bob Ballard, or, uh, and uh, taking us to the, the site. You've got the forensic scientist telling us how Titanic may have broke apart. It goes on and on, but for the general person, uh, those uh, artifacts are here for them. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I, I will say before we let you go, and, and, uh, and, and uh, perhaps Rory's waiting for you to, to walk back to the hotel with you. No. Um, <laughs> oh, God in heaven. I thought he went to bed. <laughs> oh, no, no. He's got jokes. <laughs> um, so, no, I, uh, I wanted to say um, last year I met you both here at the Speaker Series, and um, when I knew I was going to probably come back the following year, I, I remember thinking, I, I hope that David and Rory are there. I'd love to talk with them more. And, and the other gentleman who I, I, I got to meet briefly, but I, it, he was the one person I never got to have like a full conversation with um, was uh, your friend and your friend, P.H. Nargelet, um, who I think oh. this, this whole weekend has been just a wonderful memorial to him. Every single speaker has ended their, their lecture with a, a full uh, and sometimes a photo album of, of wonderful memories. Yeah, it's very difficult. Many times I'd be, yeah, I, I work from until about four in the morning. I, I love the night. I love talk radio at the night. I'd mm -hmm. leave it on in the background. And uh, many, many times I thought I should write a, a quick note a text to PH or pick up the phone because he would be in the middle of all this working with yeah. us uh, on this uh, coming expedition. So it's uh, very much missed. Absolutely. Yep. Well, um, there's no doubt he will be on that expedition no matter what. Yep. So um, thank you both for being here. And, and David, thank you for speaking you. with us. Uh, a round of applause for David Gallo. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, old guy. Let's get you home. <laughs> a glass of warm milk, maybe. With a wee drop of whiskey. These two, these two are, are basically the, the Muppets, the, the old guys in the... Uh, oh, that's them. Um, folks, we are, uh, just a reminder, we are uh, live in Orlando at the Titanic Artifact Exhibition. Uh, it's uh, James Penka here with Matt DeWinkler as well. Um, and we do have an audience. I'm seeing yawns. I'm seeing eyes closing. That's okay, but who's still awake? Yeah, all right. <laughs> it's tough. I get it. Um, I'm wide awake because I was up all night working on this last night. So, um, so I'm, I, I got so much more to go. Um, so we, it, it is now just uh, Matt and I for a little bit. We are going to, in, in a little while, we're going to throw this stream back to the gentleman. If you were listening on YouTube to our, our pre-show, uh, our pre-talk, um, uh, Kyle, Jack, uh, David, and um, uh, oh, gosh, Lee, uh, Liam. Liam, that's right. I was going to say a different name. Um, uh, th those, those guys, we'll throw it back to them um, in a minute, uh, but I will stay, we will stay with all of you here in, in, in uh, person. So, folks, this is a, a significant moment in the sinking. This uh, comes from uh, Joseph Wheat, a crew member aboard Titanic. He was standing at the bottom of these stairs, the bottom of the Grand Stairs uh, near the Turkish Bath, and he noticed water, and he says in his testimony, trickling down the stairs. This is a bit more than a trickle, I'll admit. But um, he says that, that water was trickling down the stairs. And again, we need to remove ourselves from our usual understanding of Titanic, where that's normal. But a ship is sinking. The water should be coming from the bottom. Why is it coming down to this dry deck? And that is because at this moment in the sinking, those initial compartments that were breached, 
They have now flooded, and water is pouring over into the next compartment, like an ice cube tray. And so he um, actually gives us the, the exact time that he saw this happen, and so we have it here in, in the animation. Um, he saw water trickling down the stairs, and he knew that the water on the other side of this wall, this, this bulkhead, has reached the top, and now it's filling this compartment. And it will continue that process, of course, until all of the compartments have been flooded. Uh, Matt, welcome back to the microphone. I'm back again. I'm <laughs> doing musical chairs, but it's fine because I had uh, two wonderful Muppets, as you said. <laughs> yeah. I, I forgot the Absolutely. name of those two grouchy yeah. guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't remember the Muppets' names. Um, Rory, <laughs> Rory and David are, are just spectacular. Now, here's a wonderful shot, folks. Titanic sister ship Olympic is reached by wireless. She is 505 nautical miles from Titanic and will soon begin steaming toward her CQD position at full steam. She could arrive in almost a day's time. She's not going to make it, of course. Um, but we have our, our uh, Olympic animation um, in this, uh, or our Olympic model in this animation as well. Um, slightly altered Titanic model, of course. Um, uh, because sister ships. Yes, of course. They, they do look very similar. So if you see a ship that looks just like Titanic and it's not sinking, it's because it's, it's not Titanic, of course. Um, so we've had a lot of lifeboats being launched. And I did want to talk about the floating capacity thing. It's something I really love to bring up. I think it's super important, and it actually blows my mind that this isn't something that is brought up more often. Um, it's much more dramatic to say that the lifeboats weren't filled to capacity, um, and, and it adds to the drama of Titanic. But if you read this, the surviving officers' testimonies, uh, Lighthaller in particular, or Officer Lowe, Officer Boxhall, they describe loading the lifeboats um, and when asked, why did you not load them to capacity? Like this big dramatic question. And they basically all say, oh, no, 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 no. Yes, their capacity is 65 people once they're in the water, but we have to lower them by hand. You know, two men with rope lower it down 10 stories. We could kill these people if we're not careful. So the, the lowering capacity is like 30, maybe less. So all these lifeboats are being lowered at capacity at the time and once they're in the water they can take on more people from the gangways this is something that just never happens so if there's something to throw a bit of focus at and to be upset about it's that these lifeboats were lowered and not a single one of them um, returned to the ship or, or followed orders and went to a gangway i know at least one lifeboat claimed that they went to the gangway but got worried about the suction and, and, and left. So it, it, the, the plan didn't go as planned, but the one part that did go well is they were lowered at a, a um, reasonable capacity for lowering. Because you've got to keep in mind there are two men on deck with ropes in their hands and they are lowering it. Uh, the, the, the way that these lifeboats are lowered is just such, so problematic, but at the time it was the best they could do. They still did better than that later on in the evacuation when some of those boats broke the rules because they had no other choice and were loaded oh, over yeah. the lowering capacity. Yeah, we will. Uh, here's another one. Lifeboat 6 is launched, um, contains approximately 22. Its floating capacity is 65. But, uh, and another thing to point out, um, there's, a, there's a quote from a, oh, and this is important. Um, <laughs> lifeboat number 6 has room for at least 43 more lives. This is the most empty lifeboat that is launched. Of course, we all know lifeboat number one only has 12 people in it, but it is a smaller lifeboat, so there's less space for people. So this is the most egregious, I guess you could say. But something that um, at least one passenger notes, um, I, I, oh, I won't remember the name, um, but he, he notes that um, their lifeboat had about 40 people in it. And he, find, I believe his words are, I find it uh, outrageous that anyone could think that you could fit any more people in that boat. So these boats are being loaded with 20, 30 people, and it looks really full. Um, and at least one testimony says, yes, we could have filled them to 65 people if people were standing, if people were crunched together and laying on top of each other. Like, 65, sure, but in what scenario is that even possible? Thank God the water is so calm. These boats will, will topple over if there's 65 people in them in rough seas. So it's, it is not fair uh, to the officers on deck to, uh, to point out constantly that they didn't load lifeboats to uh, capacity. And in the beginning, they're doing the best they can to convince passengers to get in these boats. They're on board the, on board the unsinkable Titanic. Everyone believes that this is a strong 
well-lit, warm ship. There's no reason to go into these small, clinky little boats, and especially because there's nothing wrong still. It's cold. Um, we have a question. Sure. Um, yeah, what, I'm not sure if our folks at home could hear that question, but um, in general, would there be a, a, an efficient way to load or to, to transfer passengers over? And what I what I will say, I don't know if there was a plan to, you know, without lifeboats, like somehow pull them next to each other. But I will say, um, any ship arriving on the scene right now, even, wouldn't want to get too close to Titanic because of. It, she may capsize at any second. She may uh, the suction may be a problem. Um, but uh, one thing that's worth noting about transferring people: if if Carpathia arrived right now, um, these lifeboats would be used to ferry passengers over, and they would get up the way that they did um, with ladders. That was the design. That's the, the design. Day. These lifeboats. We we need to. Uh, I say this all the time. We need to remove ourselves from our usual understanding of of. Titanic and, and life. When we see a lifeboat, we know that is where you go to survive a sinking ship. Back then, a lifeboat was more of a ferry. We will, we will be sinking, sure. We'll use it to get people to safety. Lifeboats are not safety in themselves. Today, they are. A, a lifeboat on a cruise ship is wildly intense. Um, it's a full, enclosed, it's almost like a submarine in some ways. So, um, so folks, after a little luck reading, reaching nearby ships, Operator Bride suggests using the new distress call. Uh, it may be your last chance to send it, he jokes. And so Philip sends one of the first uses of SOS uh, right at this moment, 112 years ago, making history. Yeah, I was, I was struggling in my notes, which are actually Kyle's notes for the, the thing about the lifeboats. But there, I think it was the, the White Star Lion ship, it could have been in Republic, which sank a, a few, number of years back in the, in the past. But I... The majority of lives were saved because the ship sank so slow and the lifeboats were able to ferry other, all the passengers to other boats which got there in enough time. And that's what were on the minds of the designers, of the commanders of these ships, that any ship that was, any ship that was going to sink, that was big, like Titanic, sink slow enough when there would be enough ships to come, come up to her rescue in time. The Titanic disaster... Uh, we, we can talk about it to the end of time. Everything perfect happened to create the disaster. She sank so slow, but fast enough that help couldn't arrive. Right. There were not enough lifeboats. No ships were nearby. Right. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, which we haven't discussed yet, is the order women and children first, and how that is interpreted on each side of the ship somewhat differently, and how that saves more lives, costs more lives, etc., and how the officers interpreted the orders of Captain Smith. Um, yes, uh, Murdoch and Lightholler are the two uh, officers, the first and second officer. And by all accounts, seem to be the only two uh, officers, and, and Wild, assumably, that those three officers are aware that the ship is sinking because uh, Pittman, the third officer, he doesn't know. And he's in a lifeboat telling a, a, a fellow passenger in a lifeboat that every, everything should be fine. So the chain of command didn't go too deep into telling them. So uh, Murdoch and Lightholler are in charge of light launching lifeboats from either side of the ship, and they have very different, um, very different interpretations. Uh, Lightholler, uh, women and children only. Murdoch, women and children first. So uh, men in the room, um, if, if you get turned away from a lifeboat, go to the other side. Try, try somewhere else. You might have a chance. And we, get, we have more distress rockets. Um, so uh, we have uh, a couple more minutes before we're going to send it to um, uh, Kyle and the boys, um, and we will stay here in Orlando, and Matt and I will continue talking, and then we'll, we'll come back to uh, Orlando um, briefly after that. Um, but one thing that's coming up in a second um, that I'd really like to touch on um, uh, is this uh, announcement that we kind of have to make here. So. Um, a few uh, days ago, last week, I think, we made an announcement for our fan base that uh, RMS Titanic Incorporated has been kind enough 
to involve us in this upcoming expedition. Um, they've involved us in the planning process and asked what would we like to see uh, from this expedition. Um, we are trying to recreate Titanic in full in multiple uh, projects. Is there a part of Titanic that we need more details on? Is there an area that we need more photographs of, more video of? Oh my gosh, of course there are. It's like, uh, uh, where do we start? So we have compiled a list of, of desires from this expedition that will help our work be more historically accurate. Um, and we asked, and RMST obliged, could we involve our community in this? Um, so we let everybody know that on this stream we would announce how our fans can contribute their ideas to us and we will um, pass along the ideas that we like the most uh, to RMST um, and to the expedition team um, and folks uh, 112 years ago uh, right now Ida and Isidore are refusing to part one of the greatest uh, great moments in romance history um, but uh, but yes so we uh, we have a way to do this now so I'm going to put um, a bit of information on the screen. One second. Um, if you send an email to contact at vdr.llc with the subject line Expedition THG, yes, Expedition, Expedition THG, um, send us your ideas, send us your theories um, that you want proven um, or whatever. Um, we will select um, a few that we, that we really like, that we really think are great, um, that, that could really help our, our project, that could help our community. And if we pick yours, we'll keep you, in my, uh, we'll keep you involved and, and so you know that your idea is being looked into. Um, of course, we have no promises. Uh, uh, we can't tell the expedition team what to do, um, but we really hope they'll, they'll take a look at our recommendations on this expedition or future expeditions. So send us your ideas. Um, uh, uh, to contact at vdr.llc. I look forward to reading all of your emails. Um, send your research. Um, you know, uh, I, I look forward, to, uh, I'll, I'll be going through them personally. Send me a little uh, funny joke as well. How about that? Um, a Rory type joke? Yes, a Rory type joke. I do love Rory's jokes. They, they, are, they, are, they are bad and that's why I like them. Um, okay, so um, we're about to get a couple more lifeboat launchings. And then we're going to um, uh, get a couple more ships in the area. None of them are going to be near enough. Um, and, and we're going to have a couple more testimonials coming up. But um, in the meantime, um, I'm going to send this back to Kyle, uh, Kyle Hudak, who is um, one of our lead uh, modelers and, um, and one of our producers. He's been with this project uh, pretty much from the beginning, uh, 10, 10 years ago. Um, he really leads a lot of what you're seeing here in terms of how incredible the work is. We're going to send it back to Kyle. We're send it back to Jack, who made this animation, and David and Liam, who are, are indispensable and, and, and wonderful fellas as well. So um, I'm going to send it over to them, and then we'll continue here. Uh, take it away, Kyle. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our little corner of the... Uh... Uh, uh oh. Hey, James, you might want to mute over there. Yes. Ah. Uh. <laughs> I think. Okay, there. They're muted. <laughs> All right. Where were we at? Yes. Welcome back, everyone, to our uh, various corners of the world. Well, yeah, well, I'm here in the Midwest. I don't know where the rest of you are. I'm in England. Ah, it's England. Really nice. I am Jolly in Pennsylvania. Old. Pennsylvania, yeah. And Liam, you're not far from me, are you? No, I'm in uh, Mid Michigan. Mid Michigan. Uh, that is not the Uper part. So, yeah, what we've seen so far is it is, it is nothing short of incredible, Jack. Uh, those shots especially the first rocket going up is something out of a movie. I mean, it just has Cameron 1997 vibes. But why don't you guys talk about the animation a bit so far, a little more if you want, and especially these interior flooding scenes that you were working on, Jack, because these are more unique and newer to our animations, and also about what's going on on the ship right now, David. Uh, so you two, go ahead. Yeah, well, these um, interior sinkings are um, 
We had a few last year. We did a few, um, but they weren't anything too extraordinary. Um, I didn't have much time to really work on them, and my computer wasn't as good at the time. But for this year's animation, I really wanted to focus on getting as much interior footage in as possible, because it's something we can do. We literally have 50% of the ship at our disposal to do whatever we want with, so my goal was basically take as much as Demo 401 and sync it. And now, of course, we we'll might get questions being like, oh, why couldn't you make that into a game? It runs horribly. It runs horribly in the editor, about one frame per second, so rendering took a while. Um, but you get these really lovely shots um, of the interiors, and it's something we wanted to include, because you see all this happening on deck, and people on the on the board deck, they think everything's fine, everything looks okay, this lovely band music's playing, but down below, it's completely different. Scotland Road's already filling, we've got the E-Deck landing is starting to fill up, um, and people can look down that staircase well, and they can see the water already at the bottom, and I'm sure a few passengers must have noticed that, and... It's it's a scary little thing we include, and it's it's something that I'm glad we included. So I just wanted to make a note saying that Lifeboat 8 had just been launched with uh, only 27 seats out of the 65 that are uh, occupied. And now here we are going back into the interior that uh, Jack was just explaining. Very mesmerizing shots here showing the lower landings of the staircase being flooded very slowly. Mm hmm definitely. Um, we've got it here, an estimate of 20,000 tons is just, uh, an estimate 20,000 tons of water is now inside the ship. And we're only an hour and 30 minutes into the sinking. Um, it's really incredible how much water she's taking on with just those few yeah. little holes. Yeah. In her size. And, and and then you have to consider that, the, you know, as she sinks lower, you know, there's water entering in more areas. Um, there were some portholes that were open. There were some that were broken uh, when the iceberg hit, uh, mm -hmm. at least a few, at least a couple. And then, you know, when it gets down to the D-deck doors, if those were open, mm -hmm. that's like an old, no, another 12 square feet of water coming in. Yeah, and then when the it... ship, the ship superstructure goes under, all these big windows break in and water flowing in. Well, yeah, I don't even think they broke that much, but you know, the water flooding in here—that's probably one of the reasons why it started dropping like a rock later on. Is yeah. so much, so many places for water to just fill everywhere, and and you know, once the bow gets filled, it just drops real mm -hmm. fast, and uh, that you know, of course precipitated the breakup, but. I want to go back real quick to you, the the interior uh, flooding animations that you did, and the ones where the water's flowing down the stairs is really impressive. I remember back in the day, uh, I think when we were talking about scenes to do for maybe like the 2016 real time, because there were a few, just a few, a very very few couple of interior flooding shots that I kind of did for that back then. I think. The idea of doing like water flowing down the uh, F deck stairs, grand staircase, had come up, and you know it wasn't pursued because there wasn't. I didn't know how to do that back then. And then fast forward again to last year when we were, or whenever when we were working on the uh, 2023 animation, and uh, I, I think what was it? We asked you about it, and you were looking into it, but just didn't. There wasn't really a way to do it. You didn't really know how back yeah. then either. It was, um, because I was going to originally try and do, if you if people have done particle simulations in games, it's very hard to simulate water. We've only just really in the past few years gotten water like this yeah. in Unreal Engine. Oh. And, and we've got um, this, uh, we have Boiler Room, uh, whichever boiler we want, room the boiler, just... room, boiler Room 5. It's, it's, it's... So what's happening here, uh, it's my, my understanding is that basically when the Boiler Room 5 was breached, it was just... Like a foot or two, a little, little distance into the coal bunker. Uh, funny enough, the same coal bunker that was on fire uh, previously during the voyage. Uh, where you see in like, Demo 401, there's like a, the, the burning uh, ash of the coals and stuff. And uh, that bunker got breached. And I think my understanding is they closed the bunker doors. And, you know, they wouldn't have been perfectly watertight, but 
they they were able to stave off flooding in Boiler Room 5 for a while with the pumps. But that only lasted so long, and eventually, you know, that bunker filled up, and I think the leading theory... You know, we'll never know everything for sure. We'll never know for certain. These are just theories. Hypotheses, or whatever. But I think the leading theory is that the bunker doors, which were, wouldn't have been very strong, uh, gave way. Um, it's also possible that some of the plating of the bunkers gave way. In any case, water, you know, once that happened you know, from the overflowed bunker, water started flooding the rest of the boiler room. And then... At that point, your fifth compartment is flooded, and, uh, yeah, that's when things kind of, yeah, uh, that's when you just kind of have lost everything. Uh, you know, the pumps, obviously, they're not gonna keep that from happening. And now we're seeing, where is this? What this corridor is, is this? On, this is the fireman's, uh, oh, bunks fireman's, yes. in the bow. Uh, they're finally, the obviously, the lower bunks filled. These, these are bunks a bit higher up on the deck. Um, I think C deck that was? Maybe D deck. Not sure which deck I shot that on, but already that bow is getting very deep. We're getting up to D deck, C deck with that bow. Um, mm -hmm. So she's going down much faster now. So we are beginning to approach a, a very pivotal moment in the sinking of the Titanic. As the text just described, there is a terrific rush of water that is entering that boiler room. This is actually coming from the emergency exit on E-Deck. All of that water is finally beginning to flow through and enter that compartment at a much faster rate. It is past 1 a.m. on the Titanic, and at around this time, there is a rumor on the boat deck that men were being allowed into the boats on the port side. And this is when confusion really begins to rain out throughout the ship crowds of people on the titanic at this point begin to move towards the port side hoping to get into these lifeboats um and also at this point as well water is notably beginning to trickle down the stairs um from the e deck staircase landing onto f deck um i believe it was steward wheat who witnessed this um, but this is a very pivotal moment because we are approaching a point in which the sinking is going to start gradually getting faster and faster. Also at this point, emergency lifeboat number one is being lowered away with only 12 seats out of 40 being occupied. We've just seen that another one of the flyers going up as well, and we'll see it in a little bit. Um... But Californian on the horizon, she sees the her crew see all eight, and they don't act on it. They don't. They use the Morse lamp. Um, they don't wake up the wireless operator. Um, I believe they thought it might have been uh, company signals. Yeah, it, this um, is another. This is another one of those things that is just going to be part of Titanic debates forever, because there are people who have argued. Oh, no, uh, uh, um, Californian didn't see Titanic. It was some other ship. Here's a map of all the things, and look at where this is and that is. And uh, I don't know what to make of it. You know, again, well, we are we, we're never going to know for certain I, either way. But, like, you know, you look at this stuff, and it's just like, you know, what other explanation is there? Well, I don't know. to me... Um... The direct the heading of the Titanic is one of the key pieces of evidence here, because a lot of the a lot of things that I read where it talks about it not being the Californian, they always say that the ship is pointing west, that it resumed its course after the collision. But we see the wreck, and the wreck is still pointed roughly north north eastish a little bit, I think. And from all the tests that they did some drop tests in the 90s to see if, you know, the bow would go down pretty much straight or if it would turn or anything. And every test that they did pretty much showed that the bow just sort of went straight down and didn't really move in any one direction. So I think it's safe to say that the ship came to a stop pointed north. And the only ship that I've been able to see on any map that is to the north of there was to the north of the titanic was the california yeah yeah 
Yeah. So I, I think the evidence leans towards yeah, yeah. Californian. Um, and we'll, we'll never know 100 percent, but yeah. And I don't know and, if the Californian you can really. It's it's kind of a yeah. combined. It wasn't just Lord, uh, the officers on the stone, second officer stone on the bridge. Uh, there's a lot of there's a couple yeah. of people with responsibility and neither one seemed to do yeah it, it will even it, a sub it, just wake up the wireless operator if they had woken yeah. up if <laughs> yeah, they had woken yeah. up evans they probably yeah. but i mean and but it's who knows, who knows? yeah it's, it's yeah. one of those well, uh, we'll never yeah we'll, we'll never know for sure um where so yeah we're we're seeing titanic here and i think it's time to throw this back to james and matt in orlando so uh thanks again everyone for listening to us and here is james and matt thank you all right folks you should be back joining with us right now in orlando of course i'm james penko we have matt winkler and we have a very awake crowd <laughs> Spectacular. We love it. Um, okay, folks. So um, I think something that uh, would have um, passed while we were uh, while we were away. Oh, no, we're, we're about to get to it. A, a, a very important part. Um, and uh, uh, we are getting to a, a point in the sinking that I really wanted to make sure that we were back here for. We will you will be with us for the rest of the sinking. Um, we've now visited all our guests. We talked to Rory. We talked to David. We now got Kyle and the boys in on the, the main event. But you're with uh, me and Matt here in Orlando with this wonderful crowd for the rest of the sinking, of which we have uh, not too much more to go, um, honestly. In fact, this next um, bit of text, we'll talk uh, a little bit about where we are in the sinking. We've answered some questions here in Orlando. Um, we talked about um, a, a whole... Uh, a bunch of topics um, and and we had a good laugh um, so everything's good everything's good here um, and I apologize I didn't turn my mic off that's uh, I made sure to turn it back on because that would have been worse um, so folks we are uh, uh, pretty much at the point where Titanic will be down to her final hour um, because it is uh, just about uh, 120 um, we're coming up on 120 um, I, I, I know I have this experience um, watching uh, these real-time sinkings. It does not look like she's down to her final hour. I'll, I'll say that much. Um, roughly 195 passengers and crew have been evacuated to this point, while over 2,000 lives remain on board, many still believing Titanic to be unsinkable. So we have an hour to go. The ship does not look like she has an hour to go. Um, I suppose the steam has stopped escaping, but that's still no real reason to come out on deck. There's still great company um, inside. There's, uh, there's a band playing. Uh, it, it's still a very festive occasion. And if anything, this is gonna be a wonderful story someday to, to when, when we get back home, oh, wait till our relatives hear about this. Um, you know, there's not too much to talk about back then. So um, Lifeboat 16 is launched. Now look at that capacity that, or that contains number 53. That has to be our highest number so far. Um, folks at home and, and folks here, one thing you may notice about our, our real-time sinking this year is a, a slightly different lifeboat launch order. Um, there's some other uh, minor differences as well. Um, there's obviously a lot of debate that goes on about uh, this lifeboat and that lifeboat as we watch Violet Jessup um, go down in, in her lifeboat, a very famous Titanic story that we all know and love. Um, but, uh, but back to the timeline, um, we're, we're very grateful to Sam Halpern for his, uh, his input on this. Um, and uh, just uh, like I said at the beginning, just um, mixing it up every now and then is, is pretty, pretty fun. And, and seeing what Sam has researched, you know, everything based off of um, uh, survivor testimony, everything, you know, um, 
I, I believe it's Light Hauler who has the lifeboat uh, launch order in this in this way, and and or or maybe he's the one who has. I don't know, but um, it, it's just very interesting to take new approaches to Titanic. If we get stuck in the same approach every time, um, we'll never uh, we'll never learn, I suppose. Um, but uh, uh, here are some wonderful shots down, and this is this is off Scotland Road. Yes, Matt, this is the like Stewards restroom. Stewards had their own laboratories, of course, because there's so many stewards. Um, you have superior stewards, but you have the quarters on E deck flooding uh, slowly but surely. Uh, I just wanted to jump back. Something we talked about in Orlando here while you were talking to you were hearing Kyle and the boys was one of the lifeboats which was lowered a while ago, uh, boat one, which was one of the boats which only held 12 passengers uh, was lowered and it had uh, the Duff Gordons aboard. And as that boat was being lowered, it was slowly lowered because it got stuck on a wire. Uh, that wire was part of the ship's uh, sounding spar, the guy wires, and that boat didn't get lowered into the water uh, finally, for a long period of time, uh, Lady Duff Gordon called it an interminable amount of time it took mm. to get that boat into the water. Uh, now, the ship, when we get back to the ship right now, we're looking at Olympic Titanic sister ship. As she's making her way to Titanic, she will never make it to Titanic. Yeah. And another interesting tidbit is uh, she is going to call Carpathia the next morning, Olympic is, and ask if she should still try to arrive on the scene. And Captain Rostron of Carpathia decides it's not a good idea to have Olympic show up at the scene at all because the survivors of Titanic might not want to see essentially Titanic sail up on the horizon after the disaster that they just witnessed. Uh, interestingly, though, a lot of these passengers will sail on Titan on Olympic soon. You know, um, we just heard from uh, yesterday uh, Frank Goldsmith Jr., um, a descendant of, of course, Frank Goldsmith. Um, who was uh, a young boy at the time, um, they sailed on Carpathia just uh, uh, not too long after the, the um, disaster, and he shared a wonderful story um, from there. Um, if you ever have a chance to hear Frank Goldsmith Jr. speak, it's magnificent. Um, the mystery ship uh, remains on the horizon, and Titanic has been trying to reach her with wireless distress rockets and Morse lamp, but they have yet to see a response um, the SS Californian is likely the ship seen. Unfortunately, their only wireless operator is asleep. And there's a, a wonderful shot of uh, uh, the ship in question, a small, a small steamer. Um, there, of course, um, rages the debate over whether uh, what, did, what did they do was wrong or would she have made it in time. Um, uh, but a lot of evidence s sort of points towards Californian probably not being able to, to do much, uh, whether she did anything or not. There was a lot of not just distance, but ice between them. I seized his hands and wouldn't let go. Come with me, I screamed as loud as I could, still holding his hands tight. There was room in the boat. It was only half full, but an officer clubbed back, uh, Ingvar. This officer tore our hands apart, and the lifeboat was let down. As it was let down, I looked up. There, leaning over the rail, stood Kurt and Ingvar side by side. I screamed to them again, but it was no use. They waved their hands and smiled. That was the last glimpse I had of them. And that is from Dagmar Brill. And uh, uh, today I took my aunt and uncle through the exhibit, and my aunt w uh, got Dagmar as her uh, passenger on her <laughs> uh, boarding pass. It's such a sad story of her and her fiance. Yeah, it's a, it's a long quote, and I don't like to have long quotes in here because it's uh, it, you know it, it takes up a lot of time, um, and there's other text I want to get to, but I couldn't I couldn't help but put that one in this year. It's mm -hmm. a very uh, painful experience. But but these last aft boats or these aft boats being lowered is when we're going to really start feeling the the human drama. Yeah, out. it's starting to it, it's just separation. starting to turn. I mean, for that to be really our first really dramatic testimony at 125 in the morning that is that's pretty astounding i mean we i i i know i was um, used to titanic being unbearably dramatic very early on um as it would be if, if we were on titanic but we have to sort of pull ourselves out of that we get a 42 out of 65 on lifeboat number 12 that's not bad that's uh that's okay um, but again, 42 people in a lifeboat, that's, that's going to be a heavy, 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 heavy lifeboat. 
um, you'll see a lot of lifeboats being lowered um, from a deck. Um, this is something that we don't get. I don't think there's any shots of this in the uh, James Cameron film. Um, so you may not know that that was even something that happened. Um, but a lot of boats were low, uh, loaded from a deck. It would be a little bit safer, mm -hmm. it seemed. There was, uh, uh, the what was that, the coal riggers. Um, there would have been a line to sort of tie to, and it would have been a, a that bit of a... That was the design, uh, the intent of how to lower the boats and fill the boats was to lower them down to a deck. Mm. But, of course, the Titanic had the enclosed promenade on a deck outfitted on her, unlike Olympic. So uh, you'll see that in some of the forward boats, that was completely forgotten. Boat four uh, is a boat which was lowered down to a deck with the un enclosed windows completely forgotten about. So they lowered them down to a deck, forgot about the enclosed windows. Uh, up second officer light tower then was told by the captain to go down, open the windows. He ordered some men down to find the key, the crank, to open the windows. And they couldn't find the crank for the longest time, so they, he just moved further aft to lifeboat six. And lifeboat four will be dangling there until almost the end of this, the, the lifeboat's launching, until like 2 a.m. That boat was finally filled with some of the richest passengers aboard Titanic. You go ahead, old man, if you want to. I'm going to take my chance with the steamer. Harry Widener, that comes from Washington Dodge. Um, Washington Dodge has a, a bunch of wonderful, wonderful stories. I, I, he was the one with the, the Stoker story from earlier that I, that I do love quite a bit. Um, a story that just popped up on the screen while Matt was talking um, that I love to point out to people because it's something that I came across just reading testimony. It's what I do for fun. And um, the, the interchange between, uh, the, the exchange between um, Fifth Officer Lowe and Sixth Officer Moody that Lowe, who survived, remembered that Moody, who did not survive, Moody um, said, you go. And it really, if, if you think about it, the, the lower ranking officer, the sixth officer, probably has less of an obligation to stay. The, the higher officers, they should stay, just like the captain will stay. But the sixth officer could absolutely get in that boat. The fifth officer will survive, the, and the fourth officer will survive, um, and, the, and the third officer will survive. So uh, why shouldn't the sixth? Um, but he, um, but he uh, uh, chose to stay back, and he never boarded a lifeboat. It's, uh, it's just an interesting bit of, I think, bravery on a different level than uh, perhaps the like going down with a ship dressed in our best. Um, and this, this quote from Charlotte Collier is such a, a special one to me, um, that, she, uh, it, that this meant the greatest loss, um, the loss of her husband. You're, you're about to see a lot of testimonials from um, the surviving women losing their husbands as a warning, um, because uh, they're, they're not always easy to read. I love these quotes, as painful as they are, because I, I just, I can only speak from my own experience, learning about like the Edwardian era and previously, um, marriage has, uh, as the further back you go, marriage is more and more transactional, more and more and more about property and more and more about that. Um, love, uh, marrying for love is, is a very modern idea. And on Titanic, it's hard to know how, where does that stand in history? And I love seeing quotes from the women describing how they lost their best friend. And I, I just think it uh, really humanizes the whole thing. I went on deck and met a sailor who asked me to help him lower the boats. The sailor said, take a chance yourself. I did, as did my friend, but the officers came along and ordered us off the boat. I read too fast. A woman said, lay down, lad. You are somebody's child. She put a rug over me and the boat went out, so I was saved. Daniel Buckley, I love that story, that this woman and in my brain, it's my, my mom's mom. That's just who I see in my head as my grandmother in that boat, seeing Daniel Buckley on, on, uh, uh, in the boat. And she says, lay down, lay down. You're, you're coming with us, you're okay. I, I love that story. It's 1.30 in the morning. Boy, I mean, it's thankfully not that late here in uh, Orlando. But um, how are we doing out there, folks? Are we still, are we still awake? Oh, <laughs> I want someone to, to cut all the reactions together <laughs> to, <laughs> to watch you guys. Yay. Um, all right, back to the ship. Lifeboat number 14 is launched. In a sign of things to come, Officer Lowe, who just left Moody up on the boat deck, um, is forced to fire warning shots into the air as the boat is lowered. This shot 
is one of the best in this animation. Straight through uh, the, the, the steel hoss pipe in the, the stem of Titanic into the windless space under the forecastle deck, if that means anything to you. That, that's what that was, um, a, a really wonderful idea. I want to say Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs was the, what, came up with that, or, or Jack and him were working on that. It's a great idea, a great shot as water um, is pouring into that, um, that spot um, right underneath the, uh, the forecastle deck. And here we have, oh, this is the windless space still. So this is where uh, a lot of the mooring and warping of Titanic took place. Uh, and this staircase, I want to point out, you see this a lot in the animation. This is probably the 10th time we've seen this staircase. And, and you may wonder why. Um, and you may wonder why we're always talking about the post office. Um, oh, sorry. Esther Hart has to interrupt. In the midst of all these stunning blows, one despairing fact alone seized my thoughts. I knew, and a woman is never wrong in such matters, that I had seen the last of my Ben and that I had lost the, la the, the most truest friend that I had ever had, um, the kindest and most thoughtful husband that ever woman had. Uh, just a, uh, gosh, a, a wonderful, wonderful quote. Um, but those stairs by the, the post office are, are special in the Titanic story because if you're a crew member and you know that there is damage down front uh, in, the, in the front of the ship, um, you can't really go down to the holds that easily. You can't go into the peak tank, certainly. Um, but a really great spot to check for damage would be this staircase that stretches from uh, the forward D-deck cabins. It goes down to E-deck. It goes down to F-deck. It goes down to G-deck. And it even goes down a little further to um, some more uh, 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 cargo uh, areas, uh, mail spaces. So uh, this staircase, you can look straight through the ship from this one spot. And that's why Thomas Andrews goes there. Captain Smith, I think, goes there. Officer Boxhall goes there. Other passengers describe seeing the mail workers going, uh, coming up from there. It's just a key place aboard the ship. And when you watch this in real time, you kind of understand more and more. Uh, uh, and, and we know a lot about how fast Titanic sank based on when did survivors say where the water was there. Oh, the water is two feet uh, to F deck, two feet to E deck, or a foot above D deck. Um, we, we owe that staircase a lot uh, because that's the place that people went. Oh boy, uh, still, we're way less than an hour to go and look at how upright everything is. She's, she seems pretty even keeled at the moment. Um, and lifeboat 15 is being launched. Look at that number, 68. Lifeboat number 15 is the only lifeboat of the night to be lowered at or beyond floating capacity. The only one of 20. But as you learned from my rant earlier, um, that's not so terrible because it really was, that, that's a dangerous thing to lower that many people in a lifeboat. And especially lifeboat 15, which is all the way at the stern of the ship, so that boat's way out of the water. So. Um, a, a, a little uh, kudos to the two men who lowered that boat. That was not an easy five minutes. That's how long it usually takes to lower these boats. It's about five minutes. And two, two men lowered the, that boat um, over that amount of time. Another rocket uh, off in the distance. Absolutely stunning. Uh, another shout out to Jack, who, by the way, loved David Gallo as well. He, he sent me a little message saying so. How are we doing over there, Matt? Just a quick check on the time. It's roughly 1.35 a.m. Titanic time. I haven't seen it pop up in a while, so I had to yeah, check. Yeah, it's about 1.35. Uh, a couple of things that are happening around the ship besides lifeboats and flooding. Um, the steward, uh, steward, John Stewart, uh, that was difficult. He was passing through the first class smoking room just to check for any passengers and he happened to stumble upon Mr. Thomas Andrews standing in front of a painting there. And this will live in infamy forever as what Thomas Andrews was doing throughout the entire night. Right. Uh, because he asked Mr. Andrews, how are you? Will you do anything, Mr. Andrews? And he, and he didn't get a reply. And so, of course, that turned into Thomas Andrews in a state of shock and, and incomprehension. But of course, we have reports of Thomas Andrews doing the exact opposite, going from boat to boat, trying to assist 
uh, helping the crew, doing everything possible. He'd be seen later on during the night, so this is probably yeah. just a moment where Thomas Andrews, we can't possibly put ourselves in the mind of... It's a, it's of a very Andrew. dramatic way to show Thomas Andrews' end. Uh, Victor Garber in the film fixing the clock by a minute in the final moments. What a, what a brilliant uh, choice by James Cameron to, to do that. But yes, um, as we will see in a little bit, um, Thomas Andrews is seen not there later on. So that was not the last thing he did. He was possibly just taking a breather and, and kind of comprehending what has been happening. Um, that last quote from um, May Futrell, Lily May Futrell is wonderful. Um, Lily uh, Futrell was married to Jacques Futrell. Um, Jacques Futrell was a writer and Lily was a writer as well. And uh, you can tell if you listen to her testimony, wow, can she write? She can make something just sound so beautiful. And for her to say, um, they knew those brave men, as my husband knew, that there was only the slightest chance in the world for them and that this parting of which they were making so light was probably forever. Absolutely stunning. At this point in the sinking, I'm starting to get on board with that sort of thing, that these men are, they are starting to maybe realize that something is... Uh, is not quite right. And here we have Olympic once again um, uh, communicating with uh, Titanic, asking if, if she's steering souther southerly to meet them um, from Captain Haddock. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm so curious about that question. She, ha she has to know that Titanic isn't sailing still. I mean, um, it's, it's a very interesting... They're and they just, have to know how far they are. They're just confused about the situation yeah. as anyone would be. They don't understand. Yeah, and we also have to remember that the wireless messages that they're that are coming and going it's it, it's always going to be confusing it's uh, you're hearing so many um uh so many ships communicating at once um and titanic can't even hear anything speaking of as titanic's power begins to dwindle so does the range of her wireless from this moment her calls for help can no longer be he uh, heard on land so anybody in the states um cape race or or wherever um, who have been listening to Titanic's uh, calls for help, suddenly they're, they're gone. Just another a quick tidbit about May and Jack Fertrell. Uh, before, they, before Jack got May into a boat, they looked down at the aft well deck and they noticed a bunch of third-class passengers who, in, in, in May's words, were n not very excited at the moment and they, didn't have all, they were not all wearing life belts. And Jack said to her that those poor devils hadn't had a chance to, of survival. Um, at this point in the sinking, the majority of third-class passengers are, are still aboard Titanic, of course. Uh, the ones that will survive are being rounded up by stewards to be brought up to the boat deck, uh, to a deck, or up to the second-class staircase. Oh, wait, we have to cut away for a moment. Oh, yeah, this. This, is, this is a pretty um, famous moment in the sinking, lifeboats um, 13 and 15. So 13 is in the water, and because of a, a discharge port that is um, pumping water out of the hull, um, they got pushed underneath the still lowering 15. Um, and 15, let's remember, is the only lifeboat launched at or beyond full capacity. So that is a heavy lifeboat that is being lowered on 13. Um, and they're yelling up to the officers, stop lowering, stop lowering, and, and they aren't able to um, stop the lowering, but thankfully, um, they're able to push their way out and cut the falls um, to, uh, to get out of that, uh, that very bad situation. Um, this is a, a wonderful story of um, men on the poop deck having a, a sharing a cigarette. Just the hum bringing humanity back to this is so important. If all we ever have are the uh, fictional stories from the movies or the dramatic stories from the, the documentaries, um, sometimes a group of men sharing a cigarette on the poop deck is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and that's why we dig deeper. That's why we, um, why we read books. <laughs> it's 1.40. So Titanic has been sinking for two hours. Um, and she has just 20 uh, or so minutes left. Um, and we actually have a bit of a, a, a chunk of time in this, uh, in our text, where um, we don't have uh, much to cover. 
So I, I ask my uh, lovely audience, does anyone have any uh, questions or thoughts even um, uh, about what they're experiencing this evening? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Oh, really? Oh, wow. A little connection to Eloise. Oh, great. I, I saw your reaction when that quote popped up on screen. That's, that's great. Huntington, West Virginia. Okay, shout out to Huntington. That's great. Yes, over there. Cameron made it obvious that there was a big difference between getting the third class passengers off and the first class passengers off for safety. Was that true? Yeah, so one of the, the go-to uh, stories of Titanic is, you know, third class being held back by gates, of course. Um, very famous moment. It's in every movie of Titanic. And that is that comes from um, testimony of a few uh, third class passengers describing that. Um, but mostly, uh, do, I, do you have an answer for this? I now? do. Oh yeah, I, having made uh, Titanic's deck plans and made a lot of what yes, you see please. here. No shout outs to myself and what I <laughs> produce, but still. Uh, uh, just a second ago, I talked about what May Futrell saw down at the aft well deck, the third class passengers. Uh, they're eventually going to try to get up and they're held back in the aft well deck by uh, crewmen holding them back at um, waist high gates. Uh, this is where they're going to really encounter the most pushback. It's crew members holding them back. Not these, uh, not the famous gates that you see throughout right. the movie because they're not actually that functional. They're not actually that um, useful around the ship in dividing up the classes. The best way to divide the classes, which was the purpose of which is not because of just like, oh, look at this tease of first class, which is what you always see in the movies. It's just the keep out the you know, you're over here, you're supposed to be here. That's what, the, you know, the mindset was and also the health and safety issues. The best way to uh, divide the classes was just a simple solid wall and door. And, and also, you have in Titanic. yeah, but also uh, one of the biggest divisions of classes, what kept you in your class was not necessarily a gate or a wall or a door, but embarrassment, um, the potential for making a social faux pas um, to be in the wrong, caught in the wrong class would really not be uh, something that anyone would want to do. And unfortunately, that you know, theoretical gate certainly wasn't helpful when third class passengers uh, wanted to go to the lifeboats, but uh, we really should wait until we're allowed to because that would not be, uh, that would be a, a, a social mistake at least. Um, so yes, the, the, the gate thing that um, we are all know and love from the films. It's very dramatic, but that is not how um, it would have happened. They certainly weren't trapped like rats. What they were trapped like were people who didn't speak English, who didn't read English. All the signs were English. I mean, they were held back by so much, but it wasn't Gates. Unfortunately, the, the so much is harder to uh, put in a Hollywood There's film. general confusion sometimes, yeah. too. Yeah. An, an organization, uh, a crew not knowing uh, one uh, Titanic historian said it best that sometimes a steward could get the little Hitler syndrome where he thought like his duty was to keep these passengers you know in their quarters and that's probably what happened on the aft well deck uh, uh, a, a third class passenger by the name of James Farrell will eventually stand up and do exactly what you saw in James Cameron's film uh, screaming at the top of his lungs to let the, the women through at least and uh, they're going to have to climb up on onto the cargo cranes. They're going to have to climb up on over the equipment to get up to the boat deck. They have to do what they're going to have to do to get up there, but they're going to make their way. Uh, or they're going to just sit there and wait until a steward comes and leads them up one by one or in groups. Uh, that's the only way that they're going to survive. Or they're just going to sit and wait and be in their quarters, be in the, the general room on the underneath the poop deck and just play the piano and try to keep their, their children entertained and calm and hopefully not panicked. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that there are way more um, uh, third class children who died. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, in fact, so that's, that's a fact. 
Yeah, it's oh, a it's fact. an absolute fact. But and, there, but something to keep in mind: there's also way more third-class passengers in general. I mean, there's um, more third-class passengers than anything else on the ship. But yes, um, uh, way more uh, 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 third-class. Oh yeah, I mean, only one first-class child died, and then um, I, s- I still think it's inexcusable. And the, oh, of course. And what, what it is is they're still neglected to death. You can absolutely you can say. Uh, we, we got a, a question oh. from Roth, the Titanic guy, who is here in the house, uh, famous from, uh, from TikTok and whatnot. Um, uh, so, Roth, what's your question? And I'll, I'll try and repeat it so people at home can hear it. Okay. This external lighting that we see here, um, how does that compare to how we think it actually was on the Oh, absolutely, yeah. So the question was, the lighting that we're seeing here in this animation this beautiful animation by Jack Gibson. Um, how does it compare to what it might have actually uh, been like? And the, the truth is we do get a lot of people um, who love our videos and they, they, they're very supportive, but they, they do point out that that's not how it would have looked. And we could make an animation of how it really looked and it would not be fun to watch because you wouldn't see anything. Yep. So the lighting aboard Titanic in general would have been darker than we are used to. Um, electricity, uh, light bulbs, the technology is very different at the time. Um, and so uh, the lighting would have just been dimmer in general. Um, but at night right now, clearly our ship model here looks like it's being lit by a big bright full moon. But we know Titan- on, on the night of Titanic there was, there was no full moon, there was no moon at all. So it would have been way darker. And we have seen people who take our animations and they, they darken it to get in it. I, it's fun, it's fun to see that sort of um, vantage point, but it, it would not make for um, a, a very enjoyable um, viewing experience. But yes, it would have be would be much much darker, and all the more reason not to get in a lifeboat. Honestly, you are on a ship that's lit, you're on a ship that's warm, um, and it's still it, it it is tilted, but it's still thousands and thousands of tons. Um, that little lifeboat that uh, I've never been you know I've never been in an open boat in my life is a quote. You know it, it's. Uh, it's terrifying to imagine getting in these lifeboats. And that, that's why to this, at this moment, and there's a t- testimonial coming up about how still they cannot find people who are willing to get in the lifeboats. Even now with the, the ship at this angle, they still think the ship is unsinkable and they still think uh, that they are safer where they are. Um, though earlier on, um, John Jacob Astor, of course, stayed on the ship. And I, I think at this moment, he's starting to be a little, a little concerned. Um, should have taken uh, Captain Smith's warning a bit, uh, a bit more seriously. Um, oh yes, yeah, so a, qu- a question in the back, and I'll repeat it for the folks at home. Yeah, uh, we're getting really close to the launch of lifeboat number four. Okay. Which includes passengers like Madeline Astor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, Matt, did, did you mention the Lifeboat 4 debacle earlier? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, just a little bit. Um, that, yeah, the, uh, Lifeboat 4 was one of the very first lifeboats uh, tended to and prepared for launching. And it was lowered down to A deck, um, but they couldn't get the windows open, so it was pulled back up. Um, Baltic is rushing to Titanic. Um, uh, that's not going to make it, of course. Um, but, the, but, yeah, so... Uh, Lifeboat 4 is almost being launched. It's one of the last lifeboats launched, but it was one of the first prepared. It's so frustrating. And the passengers were sent up on deck and down to A deck and up on the boat deck, down to A deck. It would have been extremely frustrating for all of them. Um, Olympic, I am lighting up all boi- possible boilers as fast as can. That is not a typo. That is, those are the actual words. I love that. As fast as can. No time for the full sentence. Um, so, folks, we're getting deeper and deeper into this. Um, in fact, it is it is about 1.49 in the morning, almost 1.50. We're getting to lifeboat 10 in a second. Um, things are um, getting much more dire. Um, as you can see, the list is pretty significant as well to the port There's side. There's lifeboat 4 right there. Yeah, lifeboat 4, um, as we were just talking about. And look at all those people on, on the uh, A-deck promenade. Um, and... Uh, uh, that must be one of the cutters, I suppose, that uh, that mm-hmm. two then? Yes, that's two. Lifeboat two. So now you have those deck chairs placed out in front of the, the windows, bridging the mm-hmm. gap that's created by the port list. As you can see now, Titanic's taking this port list for whatever reason. Yeah. 
and there's a, a much larger gap on the port side between Titanic's hull and her superstructure and the lifeboat, while on the starboard side, any remaining lifeboats, which there are a few, are going to encounter another rather arduous, troublesome problem of scraping along the hull as it's trying to be lowered. All right. Um, and yeah, we are, and we're also reaching almost, uh, well, it was 150. No, I'm, I'm getting, a, getting ahead of myself here. Um, one, one really fun, uh, one interesting story um, about Lifeboat 4 and, and, and being lowered. And, and as Matt mentioned, they use deck chairs to get people up into the window. Um, there were two um, children who were traveling aboard Titanic alone, you know, two young kids um, without their parents and uh, third class passengers that somehow the, the two kids must have been sent up, you know, ahead because they didn't have any, any parents. Like, let's get these kids up there. So they are standing with first class passengers waiting to get into this lifeboat. And they would find out um, once they got in the boat that John Jacob Astor himself helped them in. And what a what a moment that would be because they would know who he was. Everyone in the world knew who he was. The final distress rocket is fired. The nearby Californians officers see it explode above the horizon just as they have seen other rockets fired from the sinking Titanic. Captain Stanley Lord and his officers show a historic lack of initiative and assume the rockets are not serious. Captain Lord will face scrutiny for this inaction for the rest of his life. Um, yeah, the, the Californian story is, is very frustrating, um, um, but it, it just certainly adds to, adds to the drama. There's uh, a, an interesting question that I, I like to pose to people, is how much of the Titanic story can you pull away and change before we are no longer interested in Titanic? Um, even starting with uh, the name Titanic, if she was called anything else, would we still, you know, it, there is something about that name with what's ha what, what happened to her. Um, if you take the Californian story out, that's a big source of the drama. Um, if, you, if Titanic sank an hour quicker, would we have the stories that we have, uh, enough stories to be interested? If she took two hours longer and more people survived. If she sank today. If she sank today, yes, exactly. Over an hour since choosing Titanic over lifeboat number seven, Colonel Astor helps his wife Madeline into lifeboat number four. When he asks Officer Lightholler if he may board the boat himself, Lightholler turns him away. This is a very famous story, uh, Astor being turned away at the lifeboat. Uh, and Astor will not survive the sinking. Um, the story that's less talked about, I think, personally, is that story of him about to get into lifeboat number seven, the first boat. And at the end, the, the, the survivor who describes this said he, he pulls away suddenly. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I, I can't get in there. He had a chance, and he was fully able to get into this lifeboat. Though, in this day and age, if John Jacob Astor, in the day and age of Titanic, if John Jacob Astor gets in that first lifeboat, the, the ridicule that is coming to him, um, uh, the Astors were not well liked at the time. I mean, they, they were famous, of course, but um, they were uh, like, like some rich folks today. They were, they were not enjoyed too much. Um, women and children in boats cannot, uh, cannot last much longer, uh, MGY. Um, Titanic is, is uh, ferociously sending these messages. Um, th the messages that you're seeing, um, they come from records that we have, but I'm, I'm sure there were, I'm sure the, John Phillips never stopped. Um, and, uh, but we're just showing you some of the iconic ones uh, where we have like a, a proper sentence. Um, sorry? Uh, yes, John Phillips, the, the uh, wireless operator who likely is the one at the desk um, press, you know, uh, keying in these, these messages. He, he did not survive. Um, and here we are in the third class dining saloon. So here's an example of what we were talking about earlier, that, like, that ice cube tray situation. The third class dining saloon is in its own little watertight compartment, um, a deck below uh, Scotland Road. But Scotland Road runs the whole length of the ship, no watertight compartments for the most part. Um, so this is water again reaching the next compartment and flooding down the stairs. Um, uh, just a, a fascinating uh, journey that this water would have to go on to slowly, uh, slowly swallow Titanic as we reach uh, 155. Last 
Lifeboat number four is launched. Finally, lifeboat number four, and still only 30 people <laughs> on board. Um, really, really unfortunate. Um, but lifeboat number four does have one extra bit of history behind her that's very important. Um, and this is often forgotten. Uh, once Titanic disappears beneath the surface, lifeboat number four will be one of only two boats to brave the potential swamping and mount a rescue of those left behind. They managed to save about six men from the freezing water. Lifeboat number 14 will save another two or three. Um, we always hear about lifeboat number 14. It's in the movie. Um, lifeboat number four did rescue some people from the water, though it is worth pointing out. It's mostly because they were so close to the wreck that people were swimming to them. So they didn't have to really make that really tough decision to go back. People came to them. Um, lifeboat number 14 was the only boat that really had to uh, make that tough, that tough decision. Do we have an, another question somewhere? Oh, yes. I was wondering if anybody knew what captain the captain well, where was he? Oh, yes, the oh. captain. That's a great question, and it's worth mentioning because Captain Smith is often shown in films and TV as this, you know, sort of catatonic, in shock. Uh, you know, people come up and say, Captain, what do we do? And he just uh, keeps walking. You know, he's in shock. It's this old story that has no evidence to it. The evidence says that he was loading lifeboats, that he was ordering people around. He was yelling for the lifeboats to come back to the ship. He personally lowered one of the lifeboats, yes. Yeah, so he, he's active. He's everywhere. He's doing things. Um, of course, we don't know every moment where he was. Um, you know, very, well, very few people survived, of course, and we have to go off of when, when they mention. And here he is again. Captain Smith uh, relieves Bride and Phillips of their duties and tells them to look out for themselves. Instead, they continue sending messages, including one around this time stating, engine room full up to boilers. Um, I love that engine room full up to boilers. Does, does that mean that John Phillips maybe doesn't quite know the, the he just layout? Know, yeah, he just knows his power is, is slowly faltering and right. failing. Right, absolutely. Um, and Captain Smith is, uh, and I actually just said this, um, uh, Captain Smith's doing a lot right now. This is a, it's a great time to ask that question. What, what is Captain Smith doing right now? Because he's doing uh, quite a few things at this moment. Um, uh, 112 years ago right now, Captain Smith orders the nearby half-filled lifeboats to return to the ship and pick up more passengers. Most make no attempt to do so. As Quartermaster Hitchens puts it, it's our lives now, not theirs. Uh, Quartermaster Hitchens was at the helm. Uh, he was at the wheel of Titanic when the iceberg hit. And by all accounts, his behavior in their lifeboat was atrocious. Uh, Molly Brown, Maggie Brown, was in, uh, in his lifeboat, and they went at it. Uh, they went back and forth. Boats continue to be launched with empty seats as passengers still cannot be found to fill them. When asked where the remaining 1,600 passengers were at this time of the sinking, Chief Second Class Steward John Hardy answered, they must have been between decks or on the deck below or on the other side of the ship. I cannot conceive where they were. There's a lot of stories like this of passengers and crew looking for women, looking for children, looking for men, anybody who will get in this boat. They'll run down to the deck below and, and look down the stretch of the A-deck promenade and see nobody. Where is ev where are all these people? Yeah, that's what Thomas Andrews probably is doing, and that's what another person is was doing all night long. Uh, J. Bruce Ismay, the managing director of the White Star Line, he was running around looking for women and children to fill the lifeboats and to help out the crew to lower the lifeboats. Uh, he's going to fill and help lower, well, not help lower in a special way, uh, boat C in just a moment. Of course, um, I want to give a shout out to our YouTube audience. According, I, I'm not paying attention, but um, uh, someone just let us know that we're at, at like 6.5 people, 1,000 people watching, which is wonderful. Hello to everybody. Um, RMS Titanic continues to steam toward, or sorry, Carpathia continues to steam toward Titanic, and they are ready to rescue passengers from the sinking ship. It is clear now that Carpathia is Titanic's only hope. She will arrive in roughly two hours. Unfortunately, uh, Titanic will be gone in 20 minutes as we hit one o'clock in the, uh, sorry, two o'clock in the morning. Um, yes, a question. Yeah, um, so you mentioned uh, the lack of passengers on deck at the time. I know there's a passenger aboard named Colonel Gracie uh, who sees this massive rush of third class passengers coming up from the first class area. Um, so is it possible that perhaps they are trying to find other ways out of their spaces to get out? <coughs> 
uh, to that boat deck, and, you know, and that probably where they end up um, nearer towards the final plunge. Yeah, I mean, the um, I think we do have a, a, an important text coming up, so I might have to interrupt myself. But yes, third class passengers are doing whatever they can um, to get, uh, some of them are doing whatever they can to get up, even in some cases climbing the cargo cranes to get up on a deck where they don't know where the staircase is. Um, and yes, well, oh, here it is. Very important. Managing director of the White Star Line, J. Bruce Ismay, having spent the previous hours loading and launching lifeboats, steps into collapsible sea as it is lowered. He will face public ridicule for the rest of his life for saving himself when so many perished. The argument continues to this day whether Ismay, a passenger, had the right to this empty seat in collapsible sea. And I, I have to say, um, very unashamed to tell you, I absolutely would have done exactly what Bruce Ismay did. I think a lot of us would have. Um, and one thing, uh, as Titanic's wireless has heard for the last time, one thing I think we all owe, we owe uh, Bruce Ismay a big old thank you. If Bruce Ismay did not survive the sinking, the, the amount of, of information that we would have lost, he knew so many things that no one else knew. The, conversa you know, the conversations he had with Captain Smith um, the, the, the way that the voyage went, the iceberg warnings. If he goes down with the ship with this information, we would be so much more in the dark than we already are. So I, I thank Bruce Ismay for getting into that lifeboat, and I, I feel absolutely gutted for the, for the guy that his, his life was so difficult to follow. He has a, 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 a I mean, I, I want to say wonderful, but he has a, a pretty hard quote of him saying um, that ships bring him no more joy, and he loved them so. And that's just such a sad, a sad thing. Goodbye, friends. I'm too old to fight the Atlantic. I love that quote from uh, Johann Landahl, a third-class passenger. Um, of course, that's provided to us by uh, a, a passenger who survived, um, August Wernerstrom. Um, but yes, to go back to your question, um, uh, passengers, third-class passengers, are trying to get to the lifeboats. And in a little bit, we're going to see a large group of them arrive on, on deck, as you said. Um, it's, it's just not easy. I mean, it, I don't know how many of you know Titanic's deck plans by heart. I know Matt does. Thank you. I know people who've played our, our project, our Demo 401 on our website. I, I'm sure you, you know Titanic well enough to know how to get up to the lifeboats. But um, remember, you, I, I, I encourage you to look back to when you did not know Titanic's layout and you were just mesmerized when you learned <laughs> where things were. Um, Lighthaller himself said it took him how long, like a, a full week or something, to, or something. a fortnight yeah. uh, before he knew um, his place from one, uh, one part of the ship to the other by the fastest route. An officer who knew these ships well, he would get lost aboard Titanic. So um, they're doing everything that they can um, to get uh, to safety here. I just want to point out that as Bruce Ismay's boat, C, uh, is being lowered, it's just having difficulties because of the port list there. And Boat C um, has a lot of uh, interesting passengers in it, as it's the last lifeboat that successfully launched from Titanic's starboard side, uh, including in this boat, besides uh, Ismay, is, of course, uh, Frank Goldsmith and his mother, who we heard about this weekend in the speaker series here in Orlando. Oh, my God, it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Um, I, as we see a, a very famous story of, of Caroline Brown and Edith Evans, um, of Edith Evans being one of only four first class women lost, I have to share something that was just sent to me by our researchers. They're watching and they're sending us so much stuff <laughs> and I'm trying to go through it. Um, but uh, we got a quick calculation, um, me saying how Bruce Ismay could have gone down with his stories. Um, uh, one of our researchers did a quick calculation, and 712 out of 2,208 is roughly 32 percent. That means 68 percent of this story will never be known, and that's that is a chilling uh, a chilling statistic. Thank you for uh, for sending that our way. Also, I, I want to point out um, one other thing uh, that's a fun part of the RMS Titanic uh, Incorporated collaboration that we have uh, now that we absolutely love uh, uh, being a part of this family. Right now in Las Vegas, and Matt, I don't think you know this. I don't, think, I don't think anybody knows this, actually. I, I think we did this behind the scenes. But in Las Vegas, this, um, this real-time syncing is playing live there as well um, in, in the Luxor Hotel. Um, it's, on a, on a, it's not on like a big screen like ours is here. Our setup here is really great. We'll have to put some pictures online. But um, big shout out to anybody in Vegas who's watching this, uh, this live stream or watching our syncing. I don't, think, I don't think they can hear us talking. 
Oh boy, we're almost there, folks. It is it is uh, two o five aboard Titanic. Collapsible D is launched. Floating capacity forty seven contains approximately twenty. Now, uh, collapsible D is extremely important because collapsible D is the last launched lifeboat. Roughly 660 passengers and crew have been evacuated to this point. So anybody left will have to do so on their own. They will have, to, there, there are two lifeboats left, collapsibles A and B. Um, considering the average occupancy of these 18 lifeboats, as well as the average rate at which they were launched, Titanic would need 43 more lifeboats and five more hours to evacuate the 1,500 still on board. Um, that's a little uh, statistic courtesy of, of myself. I was just so interested in, um, in finding these statistics. Uh, instead, she has two lifeboats and 15 minutes remaining. Um, the pace at which they're launching these boats, it's just not fast enough. The capacities, they, they aren't able to lower a boat at capacity, so how could they fill it? it? It's just maddening. They would need five more hours and 42 more lifeboats to keep this pace. Um, it's really um, shocking, and they have about 15 minutes. Um, and we have about 15 minutes as we get this lovely shot from a lifeboat. Um, what an astounding sight this must have been. A question, yes, sir. Sure. Oh yeah, the lists and, and what the, um, as Bryden Phillips abandoned the wireless room, um, uh, I can answer that question. The, the, the lists to port and starboard, one thing that, that, that people uh, should know, Titanic was sailing with a list. It was, it, at, at sea, perfectly normal, it was at a slight list. Pa many passengers noticed this. Of course, Lawrence Beasley did, because he's just super perceptive. Um, but uh, the initial list, from what I understand, is due to the fireman's tunnel. The fireman's tunnel divides uh, some of the holds in two. It's like its own little watertight compartment. And so when water rushed in the starboard side, that tunnel got in the way. It's almost like a, a, a bulkhead going forward to, to aft. And so it had to, you know, the water had to rise enough to get over the fireman's tunnel to fill the port side of the ship. And so it would have righted itself a bit and maybe overcompensated potentially. Um, he was a brave man. I learned to love him that night and suddenly felt a great reverence to see him standing there sticking to his work while everybody was raging about. I will never live to forget the work of Phillips for those last awful 15 minutes. That's from Harold Bride, uh, of course, uh, wireless operator. And can you imagine if Harold Bride did not survive this sinking? I cannot what what value he brings. And that's part of the, the, this, this, this question I posed earlier. How much can you take away from Titanic before we aren't here doing this, uh, where, where a speaker series in Orlando wouldn't exist? And it's someone like uh, Harold Bride, if he doesn't survive, if he doesn't stick it out on lifeboat uh, B, on collapsible B, having an awful night, if he didn't stick it out and we lost his entire testimony, that might, be, you know, some, some of these people carry so much of our story and told so much of our story. Um, it's so valuable to have them. Um, alive, and thankfully they did survive. Um, now we're getting to some pretty dramatic visuals here. Um, this is uh, just astounding to look back at. Now there's really no ignoring the fact that this uh, that these life uh, that the that the ship is sinking. You can't you can't sort of talk yourself out of this. this should almost be about two ten. And I've lost my spot in my uh, my notes here. Oh, I fell way behind. Here we go. There's not much more to say. Yeah, this we're, point anyway. we're actually getting to a point where we uh, what we like to do for the final ten or so minutes is actually not talk. You know, this this live stream, believe it or not, is not about Matt and I. Um, and so we like to just sort of let the final minutes play. Um, let you listen to the band a bit. Um, it does get very dramatic. It does get hard to, to watch at times. So um, uh, just be prepared, of course. It is 2.10 in the morning.
I think uh, folks can hear a familiar tune. Almost. Almost. The band has switched throughout the night. They were originally playing ragtime and, and fun songs to be uplifting, but at a certain point, they transitioned to first patriotic songs and then eventually to more religious hymns. And now towards the end, they're only into the, the gospels, the spirituals. That religious tune will be playing quite shortly. Ah, uh, yeah. I see. We're we're about a minute away from the potential finale of that infamous concert. Around this time, a massive crowd of one or two hundred third-class men, women, and children finally reached the boat deck. Um, what a sight to see that! Um, um, a terrifying thing to arrive on a boat deck that only has two lifeboats left and they're collapsible boats, and they're up on a, the roof of the officers' quarters. There's really no organization on how to get these down. Um, and, uh, and then here we go, actually. Following an evening of upbeat ragtime and calming religious arrangements, Titanic's orchestra plays a final somber tune to conclude their infamous performance. And as Lawrence Beasley put it in one of the great quotes in Titanic's story, Many brave things were done that night, but no more brave than by those few men playing minute after minute as the ship settled quietly lower and lower in the sea, and the sea rose higher and higher to where they stood, the music they played serving alike as their own immortal requiem and their right to be recalled on the scrolls of undying fame. And folks, from this moment on, we will just let you watch the animation and uh, take in the sights and sounds and we will see you on the other side.
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you very, very much for joining us this evening, this morning. Um, I know that that's, that's a, a whole lot to, uh, to take in. Um, before we all go home and go to bed, uh, I just want to uh, thank Jessica Sanders and the entire team at RMS Titanic Incorporated. And I'd love to thank all the people on, that have been appearing on the screen in these credits, um, most notably Jack Gibson, who spent the last 10 months making this, and uh, all the people who have helped him that you can see their names here, uh, uh, particularly um, you know, Kyle and Matt and, and, uh, and all the research team, um, Sam Halper and everybody. I'd love to, love to thank especially Rory Golden and, um, uh, and David Gallo for joining us. Um, before we all go, I'd like to, to end this. Uh, Matt, would you like to say anything before I, I wrap things up? Yeah, I would say uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you to remember this event. Uh, it's always humbling to think of these people 110 years, 111 years, and 112 years on again and again with so many others and to do it in so many special ways um, to make sure that their memory never fades away. Uh, they changed so many lives going through the, the worst moment of theirs and I just want to say thank you for being here and special thanks to everybody that James also mentioned too. Yes and, and Jack who made this animation wanted to uh, extend a thanks uh, and the whole team wants to extend our thanks to RMST and for all of you for being here. Um, my last thing I'll say, and then we'll go, um, people often ask um, why uh, we do stuff like this. Why are we uh, keeping ourselves up at night um, uh, for Titanic? It's, it's odd. Um, but I think if, if, this, if this evening did anything for you and anything for those watching at home, um, if, if it did anything, I hope it inspires you. I hope it inspires you to go to bed tonight, to go home, get in bed, pull that blanket up to your up to your chin and just clutch onto it a little tighter feel the warmth feel the safety of the home that you live in if you have someone next to you hold them a little tighter um, these people these 2208 um, individuals they endured one terrible terrible cold night so that we may experience many many warm nights ahead um, I hope you feel that way tonight uh, and then um, and every night for the next 365 nights until you join us again next year. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear us? <clears throat> so that was, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to come up with the words uh, for what we just saw, uh, honestly. Like, as we've been animating and working on this, uh, this whole thing for the last however long, you know, it's easy in some ways to kind of lose grip of like the gravity of what you're um doing and like you know what kind of what happened although i think jack most of all kind of felt it why don't you tell us jack a little bit about how you know how, how were your kind of thoughts and feelings about when you were working on this animation how did it because I, you on our team, I know you, uh, you're known for, you know, um, slaying a lot and that kind mm -hmm. of thing, but, it, you know, you're, you can be pretty jovial, but I understand that, you know, working on this, it made you think, how, how did you feel? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, you, you watch the movie, you watch documentaries about it, you, you play the demo, you do, you read about Titanic, and it's, it becomes more of like a. It feels. It can sometimes feel fictional. 
when clearly it, it, it obviously it wasn't. But you you watch these things and you like you don't really understand what went on and like the movie doesn't do it justice. The movie does it well, but you're focused on the characters. You're not focused on the two thousand two hundred and eight other people on the ship and. The thing I found, I had this a bit last year, but I really had it this year. You begin to understand a fraction of what they went through while you're making one of these. Because I've been, since October, I've pretty much every day I've been working on this. And there'll be nights where I I finish animating a lifeboat and you put the people in the lifeboat and you, you film a POV from... I got one for like I'll here's a little anecdote. I did the POV from Lifeboat Four and that's the boat Madeline Astor was on and she just left her husband on that ship and she was barely eighteen. Like I'm I'm well, I'm nineteen and the thought of that is like it's haunting to think about that. She 'cause she they that lifeboat four was so close to the ship and you you begin to understand a fraction of what they went through when you watch one of these or when you make one of these and it's no one's ever gonna truly know how it was that night, how how it looked, how it happened, and most of all how it felt for those people. Because even those who survived, none of them were the same after this. Everyone walked away from this, changed, and I, I think that's the thing that we often forget is that fifteen hundred people were lost, but seven hundred people never went on to live the same again after this and it's it makes you think you watch these and it makes you think a bit more than any documentary or book or film can do which is why i it's why i love the real-time sinkings it's jim's put it perfectly there it's why we do it's why we stay up at it's now 6 a.m in the morning like what what madman would do this but i'd do this and i know many of us do it and it helps us understand i think what i went on because we're all obsessed with this ship, and sometimes we don't really know why, but you watch these and you start to understand a little bit of what they went through. And yeah, it's it's it, it's it's deep. It's very deep. It's something hard to describe. Very hard to describe. Yeah, and that's true for Titanic in general. And like, you know, even me, like I'm in a weird position because... You know, there are different kinds of people who are interested in Titanic in different kinds of ways. <clears throat> and, you know, different kinds of researchers and historians. And, you know, there are people who are into Titanic um, as just a general story. There are people who are really interested in the passengers and the crew. Uh, sometimes even very specific passengers. Like, they they, they, they might know everything in the world about um uh, you know, of uh, uh, Brown or any of these other people, or they're interested in the crew specifically. You know, there's a whole book just about the crew, and there's people who are interested in the construction and Belfast. You know, I went and snowballed all of Belfast. You know, that that the gantry and all that stuff. And there are people who are just into the ship. Um. You know, to obsess over all the little details, the rivets, the fabric patterns, and uh, things like that. And it's easy to just kind of get caught up in all these different things. And But, you know, at one point or another, you kind of look, you step back and you look at the wider story and you kind of just feel like, wow, you know, it's it's hard to describe really... And anything, like people try, you know, they give speeches and they try to tell you, like, we are, you know, what what does Titanic mean for them and what, why are they into this? But it's really, really hard to put that into words, I think, for any individual. You could try, but you can never capture the full picture. Why do people just, you know, they? it's like a virus, you know, Titanic gets in you and then it doesn't leave and it just stays there forever you, you always get dragged back to it and that's you know we see that with everyone from you know kids growing up to us here to 
people like James Cameron and Louis Abernathy. Like, you know, they, they just, you know, even the, you know, even these big actors and directors and all that, even they can't escape the Titanic bug. It's kind of, yeah. You know, I was asked earlier tonight, you know, what <laughs> a question, you know, what were in, yeah, did any other ship sink before Titanic? Uh, why are people? Why is this one so famous? And I don't really have a good answer for that. I, I mean, I could say the obvious stuff, you know, the story and all that, but every ship that's ever sunk has stories. And but I think there's just so many elements in Titanic story that line up perfectly, and it just it's one of those events in history that, for one reason or another, everything just kind of came together to create something that people remember. I mean, that's why it's a night to remember. I think uh, uh, what... something with Titanic that's very captivating and something that everyone will always remember, and perhaps it's one of the reasons why people are so drawn to the Titanic to this day. This ship was the largest man-made moving object at her time. She was one of the most comfortable and revolutionary liners of this time period. She had so many, so many well-known people from all over the world aboard this ship. And what happened was, when she struck that iceberg during her maiden trip and began going down, it was sort of a situation where everyone from all three classes aboard this ship whether you be in first class or third class, everyone shared that same struggle. Everyone was in quite literally the exact same situation. All of those classes merged together into one, and they shared that exact same awful experience that night. It, it, it was an event like no other. There were so many shipwrecks that have taken place before and after Titanic that, in many cases, had far greater loss of life than what we see on the Titanic. But the thing is with the Titanic, the reason why it's so special is because so many things just lined up into one with this story. The largest ship ever conceived by mankind up until that point slowly going down with all of these people on board, rich, famous, some of the poorest in the world, it's just unimaginable. It's inconceivable to even think about, and not even to mention that Titanic took two hours and 40 minutes to go down, and because of that, there was just so much time, and there was just, there was so much time for all of this drama to unfold and play out. Yeah. And the fact that it stayed upright for all this drama to play out. I mean, you know, if it had exactly. if it had rolled on its side and floated there for two and a half hours, it would have been a very different story with the same amount of time. Absolutely. And <clears throat> yeah, it's just all these factors. And it's just the stories also, the individual stories of kind of individual stories that came out of it, especially of like nobility and the people who you know, gave up their seats in the lifeboats and, you know, especially like the, the more, the wealthier people, because especially, I, you know, not, I'm not going to get political, but, you know, it, it's, I think it's difficult for people to imagine that kind of thing, in, you know, in the modern age, you know, or for anyone really. And, but here on Titanic, you had these people who are like, no, I will, I will, you know, all the, these people with wealth and power who are like, I will not give up my seat for the women in the lifeboat. Or for like the women and the children, you know, like I, I will not take up their seat, you know, it's just one of those things. It's all these little things about Titanic that come together to create this story. I, I will say one aside that one thought I had earlier that I wanted to mention on the point of the Californian, because even in their, even in their case, I'm sure that they, there's like nuances to the story and one thing that i kind of say not quite in defense of them but sort of in the sense that well let's say they looked at titanic and we're like oh we better go or let the captain know and go get him 
just turn on the engines and go. Uh, you know, people have discussed this, and I think the general I sort of consensus is that even if they had done that, they probably would not have gotten the Titanic in time. I mean, there there are people who say, "Oh, if California had gotten there and just went, they could have saved everyone." Now, no single there should not have been one single person dead on that ship. Everybody should have survived, and I don't think that's the case like even if californian had gotten there it probably would have gotten there you know when the ship was in the latter stages of the sinking um when it was just going down or oh i got a cat here sorry <laughs> when it was just going down or just after it went down or who knows when and uh, you know, at least some people would have, you know, maybe it could have saved some more people. Who knows? It, it would depend. Or maybe it wouldn't have really helped anything at all. Uh, at the, or at the very least, a few would have, uh, have died. We'll never know. But I think it's easy to look back on history like this and just and say, oh, if I was there, I would do this and I would do that. You know, it's a bit like the Jack and Rose thing. You know, oh, if I was on that door, piece of wood, I would do this. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. That's not how that works. And yeah, it's... I think that it's um, it's just absolutely incomprehensible to think that you had so many ships that were rushing to the Titanic's aid. You had ships such as the La Provence, who was way early on in the sinking. She did a full one eighty to rush to the aid of the Titanic. And this ship was a bluer band liner for a very short period of time. And this isn't just her. You had ships such as the Baltic, the Olympic, her sister ship, all of these ships rushing to the Titanic's aid. And with all of these ships aware of what was taking place aboard the Titanic, and with all these ships knowing the dire situation the Titanic indeed was in. It was just a situation where, although there was so many, so many ships rushing to the aid of Titanic, they were just too far away. And it's just such a tragic thing to think about. In the case of La Provence, which I mentioned just prior, she did a full 180 and began steaming towards the Titanic. But unfortunately, she realized that um, Titanic was just simply too far away. And she was forced to do a 180 again and resume her original course. It's just such a tragic thing. Yes. And there's another point, too. Because, uh, you know, going back to, you know, how could they have done things differently? The lifeboats. Like, obviously, if they had loaded them overflowed them past capacity that you know they wouldn't have saved everyone if titanic had had lifeboats for everyone aboard obviously the amount of time taken would have it would not have allowed for all the lifeboats to be launched properly the certainly and you you could argue that okay well if the you know maybe they'd have a situation like with the collapsibles where it sinks and the lifeboats haven't been launched sure but maybe some of them would float off deck right side up or upside down and, uh, you know, maybe some people could use them, and they'd save more people. Maybe, maybe. But I don't think there are... I don't, I don't think there's any scenario that could have played out one way or another where the ship, you know, whether it's the lifeboats or a ship arriving or whatever, that would have saved everyone on the ship. That's, that's kind of my view on it. It's Absolutely. Very, it seems that, like, at the very least, you'd have at least... You know, like that poor guy who was... Uh, I forgot his name... Uh, who was down in the boiler rooms and got his leg injured and was stuck down there. At the very least, maybe, you know, it's it's just kind of how things play out sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I I also like to believe that there was nothing more that could have been done to get any of the passengers, any more of the passengers off the ship. I mean, as you explained, if there were more lifeboats, that probably would have gotten in the way of things and besides they would not have had enough time to lower those additional boats anyway we can yeah. trace this back to the lusitania 
actually. If we take a look at the case of Lusitania, those collapsible lifeboats which were located inboard, those got in the way of things quite often. And there's stories of just these boats it just being in the way and passengers not being able to reach them because there was just so much clutter. So I tend to agree that in the case of Titanic, there probably wasn't anything more that could have been done, unfortunately. Just a very tragic thought. And it's yeah. lucky that um the, the ship lasted for as long as it did, too, because, again, Andrews gave it an hour, maybe maybe two max. And she lasted for double that. So they had they were very fortunate in how long it took for the ship to sink <clears throat> that she remained as upright as she did unlike other ships um but yeah i don't know if there would there there's not much else that i think they could have done to change the outcome they don't unless they saw the iceberg earlier that's about the only thing that might have changed what happened. Yes. I There's something important that I need to bring up again. And it's earlier in the stream. Uh, by the way, I hope you're all enjoying this uh, footage that RMS Titanic Incorporated have uh, provided for us. It's fantastic uh, footage. And I can't wait to see what they bring back, uh, what they bring back in terms of like footage and whatever uh, for this next expedition. It's going to be probably even clearer than this because this stuff, I believe, is from 2010. And you just imagine how much better things have gotten since then, like the tech and the cameras and, the, and all the other stuff. So we, as you know, we have uh, partnered with RMS Titanic Incorporated. And one of the things we're doing here is for their upcoming expedition, we are helping them to just kind of give feedback on what kind of uh, targets they should try to look for. Because what they're doing is they're going to the wreck site and they're sending down ROVs, remote operated vehicles. Uh, these are unmanned. There's no people going down there. And they're just going to document the wreck site. And this is something that's important to do. You know, people will often say, I'll leave the wreck alone. And yeah, I don't think that's something that's wise. I think the wreck needs to be fully documented. And it has not been fully documented yet. It's not properly, not in full, especially the debris field. I think a lot of that is uncovered still. Uh, it's it's still kind of in the dark as to what's there. And so before all that disappears, it would be good to just keep going down there and documenting as much as possible. And so for this upcoming expedition, we're going to do our part to kind of help, help kind of figure out what could potentially be documented, what could have something, a closer look. What do we want them to take a closer look at? And if, you know, depending on what they can do, they might see one of these suggestions and be like okay let's go take a look at that that's interesting and so you know we're sending in our, our some people on our team are sending in our own suggestions but we are offering you guys to give your own suggestions we mentioned this earlier in the stream we're mentioning it now again so if there's if you know anything about the wreck at all i know there's there's not a ton floating not it's not all floating around out there but i know there's some stuff that is you know, if you are somebody who just gets a hold of anything you can about the wreck and you look at this and this and or you have questions about something that something that you want looked at closer or something that maybe you would hope is is found. Maybe there are no pictures of it yet, but you hope some it can be found somewhere. Uh, you can send your suggestions to us and we will forward those to RMST. And... Uh, you can do that via this email contact of course c-o-n-t-a-c-t contact at 
vdr.llc. Contact at vdr.llc. And when you send that email in, send it in with the subject Expedition THG. Uh, please do that. That email, contact at vdr.llc, subject Expedition THG. Include in the email what you would like us to uh, you know, tell them to look at on the rec. And we will try to forward that. And that's the one way that you guys can participate in this upcoming expedition. And that's how we'll be participating. And we are very excited to do that because there's so much about the wreck that we still don't know, especially in the debris field. And what was the other thing? Yes. MO401. As you know, uh, we did another snowball. It's pretty much everything we do is snowballs on this project. It's more like Titanic, Honor, and Snowball. So, yeah, Demo 401, it uh, underwent a ton of updates, mainly in, like, optimization and stuff. And it, it just looks so much smoother. It looks better in so many ways. And that has been released. It was released back on the 11th. So you can go ahead and head to uh, titanichg.com uh, and then go to Project 401. So titanichg.com uh forward slash i don't know which slash that is uh slash for project dash 401 and or you could just click the for project 401 button on the main menu and that'll take you to the page where you can download the demo and this time it's got like a nice installer and stuff and it's just easier to uh use so that <clears throat> that is that for the demo for the expedition remember you know, people have put in the chat there, contact at vdr.llc, subject Expedition THG. Send in your suggestions for what you would hope Armist Titanic Incorporated can look at on the rec and document. And again, it's very important that this kind of documentation is done. Because once, Titan once this stuff is eaten away, regardless of when it happens, it's gone forever. You know, there's going to be no documenting it. It's important that we do this stuff now, and we do as much of it as possible. Uh, because you might think, oh, what else is there to learn? A lot. There's still a lot that can be learned. There's a lot of stuff that can be found. And it's out there, just waiting to be seen. Waiting to have the lights of cameras sh shown upon them, and just seen for the first time since they landed on the seabed. There's all kinds of potential stuff out there. And there are things that are worth taking a closer look at. And a lot of this hopefully will help us in our efforts to recreate Titanic. So uh, anybody else got any thoughts about any of this? About uh, the expedition, thinking about the animation, or anything else? I just have to say, Jack did an amazing job this year. Um, I have nothing but good things very positive things to say about what he did. Uh, all those interior shots looked amazing to me. Um, and the only other thing I could say is uh, uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in to listen to us tonight. And uh, thank you for spending the anniversary of Titanic's loss with us again. And... Um, yeah, that's all. That's all I really have to say. You know, um, reading these survivor testimonies, it's it's one thing, but you know, Jack put many months into producing this animation that we viewed tonight, and as I said, reading survivor testimonies, that's one thing, but actually being able to view it actually being able to watch it that's a whole different thing and you know i i really just wanted to say that it's you know it's 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 been an absolute honor to be able to help out with this project and it's been an absolute honor to be able to be a guest co-host on here with you all tonight um this was my first stream being able to uh be on a stream like this regarding Titanic and uh, I, I just wanted to say this is 
it's uh it's been an absolute honor and thank you all for joining and spending titanic's anniversary with us tonight oh i don't know where to even begin um thank you both david and liam for those lovely words um thank you to the audience watching everyone we've had on tonight um in orlando and in um and in the chat it's it's been a it's been a long long year making this but i'm it's it's incredible to finally present it um and it's 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 hard to describe it's 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 just i'm very thankful for everyone who's helped us get to this point um all our amazing fans the amazing titanic community the support we get every day and just yeah i i just thank you to everyone um it's like i could not do this by myself it's it's been a long process but everyone's pitched in and come together and we've made something pretty incredible here i think um and uh yeah just again thank you to everyone um one note um these real time thinking will be available in an, sometime today on youtube full uploads 4k all the sounds no commentary That'll be oh, up yes. in a few hours. Um, and I'd recommend watching that just for the sound design as well, without the commentary. But again, thank you to everyone. It's been an incredible night, and can't wait to do this next yes. year. Yes. Um, yeah, and the new animation, it, yeah, it's going up today. I, I don't <laughs> or have the time uh, off the top of my head, but if you don't like listening... To uh, James and Matt and the Muppets, sorry, <laughs> talking over the animation, and, uh, and you want to hear all that beautiful sound design and all that music. Oh, the music! Jack, you did a great job on the placement of that. The music really makes this animation. Like, on the one hand, you know it's an absolutely horrifying event, especially later on, but for most of it, and I guess it's in a way, kind of in how it played out in real life too, which is why so many people were lulled into a false sense of security thinking that the ship wasn't going to sink. Most of the animation is almost relaxing. I mean, even the even the, the rocket blasts are almost uh, comforting in a way. And by the way, I can't get over how beautiful the rockets look on that. But it, it will be available later today at some point. You can watch it, the whole thing. No commentary, just the animation 4K. It's super mm -hmm. crisp. Uh, you, if you think it looked good on the stream, wait till you see it in 4K. Oh, yes. yeah. Because this is just uh, 1080p, I think, on the stream. Also, I hope yeah. you're enjoying... And again, I hope you're enjoying this footage from RMST. It, it really is incredible. I'm just kind of sitting footage. here... I'm just, I'm just sitting here watching it. It's amazing. It just highlights why we need to just document this wreck and preserve it as much as we can. And so yes, the demo, uh, not the demo, sorry, the animation tomorrow, but of course, go check out the demo as well. Uh, what else is there? What else is there? We'll have to wrap up soon. I know a lot of people are desperate to go to sleep. Anything else, uh, guys? You got your words in. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy with. Um, I got my final words, and I'm. Yeah. Okay. I'm just thankful again. Yes, we're all thankful. We're thankful for everyone who tuned in here. I think we peaked at about seven point five thousand viewers, and that's incredible. I, I uh, thank you all for. All you people who uh, stayed with us this whole time, who joined us later on at any point, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, thank you, thank you to those as well who sent in super chats. Uh, apologies that we couldn't uh, get to them, but yeah, I don't know, it wouldn't have been quite appropriate. And there's just so much going on. And thank you all in general for your support now and recently and over the years, especially some of you who've been with this. Uh, fans of this project for a decade uh earlier it was mentioned that i've been with this project since the beginning not just the beginning since before it i mean 
before THG was THG. I've been working on my little hall models since late 2010. And Matt's been at this even longer, since 2008, 7 maybe, uh, back even before Lost in the Darkness. So yeah, thank you everyone for watching this animation, for, for being with us here, and your support and your comments, your support, even your criticisms, everything. Thank you everyone, thank you everyone. Uh, and yes, thank you. I hope you all have a good night and a good night's sleep. And just remember people who all those years ago, 112 years ago, were robbed of a good, of a good, of a good night's sleep by an iceberg and fate and just, you know, the, the way things kind of go sometimes. And just uh, think about them tonight. Guys, any, any uh, final words? Just to remember um, the 2,208 men, women, and children who yep. were aboard the Titanic 112 years ago. All right, everyone. You all have a good night. And thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night, everybody. Thank good you for night. tuning in. Good night, everyone. Thank you.